Good morning, and welcome to today's public hearing. My name is Penny Lassiter, and I am the Director of the Sector Policies and Programs Division at EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. My division did the work developing this rule. We are pleased to have Tomas Carbonell the Office of Air and Radiation Deputy Assistant Administrator for Stationary Sources joining us this morning. Tomas, thank you for being here. I'd like to turn things over to you for some remarks before we begin today's public hearing. Um, thanks so much, Penny, and good morning, everyone. As Penny mentioned, I'm Tomas Carbonell. I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator uh, for Stationary Sources and EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. And I just wanted to take a minute to um, welcome you and to thank you for attending today's public hearing uh, to share your comments on our proposed rule to reduce uh, toxic and other harmful chemicals from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and certain polymers and rosins. This proposed rule would cut more than 6,000 tons a year of emissions of toxic air pollution from these chemical plants. Uh, including highly toxic chemicals like ethylene oxide and chloroprene. It would also dramatically reduce the number of people with elevated air toxics related cancer risks in the communities that surround the plants that emit these two chemicals, uh, especially communities that have been historically overburdened by air toxic pollution. EPA announced this proposal in April, and since that time, we've held an informational webinar to review the proposal and answer questions. And now we want to hear from you, uh, and this public hearing gives us a chance to do that. While many of you are here to speak to us today, we also encourage you to submit comments in writing. Just as a reminder, you can submit comments uh, through June 26th, 2023, and we give all of our comments, um, whether they are uh, submitted in writing or delivered at, at a hearing like this, the same level of consideration. We're currently under a deadline to issue a final rule uh, by March 29th, uh, 2024. Um, so once again, we really appreciate your taking time out of your day uh, to share your insights and perspectives with us. Um, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the proposed rule um, and, and your feedback is really critical as we work to develop a final one. Uh, with that, I'll turn things back over to Penny to, to get the hearing started. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. And, and thanks to all... And thanks to all of you attending today and for taking time out of your day to share your comments on EPA's proposal to update several rules applying to synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. This pr proposal, which EPA announced on April 6, 2023, would significantly reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from these plants including the highly toxic chemicals, ethylene oxide and chloroprene. The proposal encompasses three national mission standards for hazardous air pollutants, referred to as NESHAP. The hazardous organic NESHAP, referred to as the HON, the group one polymers and resins NESHAP, and the group two polymers and resins NESHAP. It also addresses four new source performance standards that apply to synthetic organic chemical manufacturing. Now I'd like to ask our other EPA panelists to introduce themselves on the panel. Good morning, my name is Njeri Muller and I'm an engineer in EPA's Sector Policy and Programs Division. Hi, my name is Johanna, and I am an environmental engineer in EPA's Sector Programs and Policies Division. Thank you. We are also joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. Now, before we begin the hearing and from, um, begin hearing from you, 
We do have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to review to help make today's hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on this panel, to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will mo monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. We ask that everyone remain muted with their cameras off until it is your turn to speak. Okay, let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will put the names of the next speakers in the chat box. We will also use the chat box to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it's their turn. Let me apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. If you're speaking today, please rename yourself in the Zoom participant list to match your registered speaker name. This will allow our logistics staff to quickly queue up the next speakers. If you need help with this, please chat with attendee support. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you're joining us via Zoom, that button to mute and unmute is on the lower left of your screen. If you're joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. Please state your name, your, your name, your first and last name, and spell it for the record. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you're providing testimony, you're welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you're not testifying, please keep your video off. One moment, please. Um, each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. A four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it's time to stop. If you're testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we're gonna strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you'd like to share, such as a slide presentation or video, you may submit them to the docket for the proposal through June 23rd. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, through June 26, 2023. Instructions for submitting comments are on our website at www epa.gov. We encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post reminders about how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. We're here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you're finished speaking, please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. 
Once we're done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. If time allows, we may be able to add additional speakers. If you did not pre-register and are interested in speaking, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. Our logistics team will help you know if there are any time slots available and assist you with registering. For those of you watching the hearing on YouTube and would like to speak, please email our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. Finally, today's hearing consists of three sessions, morning, afternoon, and evening. If there are no additional speakers, we may close the session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We also may take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time today to share your comments on EPA's proposal. So now let's get started. At this time, I'd like to invite the first two speakers who will be Cynthia Palmer and Lucia Valentin. So Cynthia, if you'd like to begin, thank you. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Palmer and I'm the Senior Analyst for Petrochemicals at Mom's Clean Air Force a community of 1.5 million moms and dads fighting for clean air for our children. And you see this, I don't know if you can see her. This is my best friend, Ursula. We met in college and quickly realized we were soulmates. We remained close over the years. She was my bridesmaid and I was hers. We were only half joking in saying, we wished we didn't like boys so much so we could have married each other. Ursula grew up in Houston, just a few miles from four Han facilities, the Houston refinery, the Goodyear Houston chemical plant, the TPC group chemical plant, and the Eco Services Operations Facility. Her mom died when she was a kid and her dad relocated to Port Arthur where their home overlooked a tank farm. There they lived near five Han facilities, some just a mile away. Motiva Chemicals, Flint Hill Resources, Chevron Chemical, Motiva Port Arthur Refinery, Veolia Technical Solutions, and the NAFTA region's Olefins Complex. Ursula cannot speak to you. She died from a malignant cancer when her children were in preschool. We will never know whether her death was pure bad luck or whether it had something to do with the nine Han facilities she grew up next to. Maybe it was some combination. Maybe she paid the price for being athletic and sucking in the extra air as she went running near her home. What we do know is that ethylene oxide, 1,3-butadine, and dozens of other toxic chemicals emitted by Han facilities can ravage the human body. I urge you to fix the following five components of the rules. One, it's great that the fence line monitoring includes six chemicals, but this still leaves about half of the facilities with no fence line monitoring requirements at all. I urge you to add other sentinel pollutants, require fence line monitoring at all facilities and mandate more sensitive detection technologies. Second, we are asking you to increase the flare efficiency and to require direct monitoring of flaring emissions. Third, it was a good start to upgrade the leak detection and repair standards for ethylene oxide and chloroprene. Please update the LDAR standards for other chemicals as well and require more advanced detection technologies. Four, in your community-focused risk analysis, 
We ask you to include non-cancer endpoints such as miscarriages and neurodevelopmental impacts and to explicitly link the risk assessment to the regulatory requirements in the rule. Five, we appreciate the removal of startup shutdown and malfunction exemptions. Be sure not to add any new SSM exemptions as part of the work practice standards. A strong chemical manufacturing rule will help reduce the pollution burden for people living near polluting facilities. We are counting on you to make the rules as protective as possible. Maybe you will save someone's best friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Palmer. And now I'll see if the panelists have any clarifying questions. Okay, thank you. Um, then I will move on to Ms. Um, Valentine or Valentine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Lucia Valentine, L-U-C-I-A-V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-E. -E. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Again, my name is Lucia Valentine, and I'm the West Virginia organizer for Moms Clean Air Force. I'm from Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and have lived in the Mountain State my whole life. And I'm here today because petrochemical manufacturing is one of the heaviest polluting industrial sectors in the country. And I strongly suppose the proposed uh, I strongly support the proposed chemical manufacturing rule and call on EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards in order to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities that are harming people's health and heating the climate. So more than 80% of the covered facilities under this rulemaking have violated pollution laws during the last three years, some for every single quarter, and roughly one third of the covered facilities under this rulemaking currently have what are classified by the EPA as the most significant and highest priority types of violations. In West Virginia, four facilities are covered under the proposed chemical manufacturing rulemaking, including the Altiva facility located in Industry, West Virginia. According to an EPA analysis, the demographic makeup of communities near the plants covered under the chemical manufacturing proposal found a higher than average percentage of residents who are African American, low income, or Latino. The Institute is one of the just two majority Black communities in West Virginia. It is not by accident as chemical and petrochemical facilities are commonly cited in communities that are disproportionately impacted by multiple pollution sources contributing to a cumulative pollution burden. Approximately a thousand feet away from the Altiva facility is the Union Carbide petrochemical facility that has very high ethylene oxide emissions contributing to the area having one of the highest cancer risk rates in the country. And in majority black census tracts, the estimated risk of cancer from toxic air emissions is more than twice the risk found in majority white tracts. So this is why it is so important for the EPA to consider the cumulative toxic emissions of nearby polluters, and I support the EPA's efforts with the community risk assessment. I also encourage the EPA to link the findings in the community risk ass assessment more directly to the regulatory requirements in the rule to protect communities overburdened by multiple pollution sources. And a strong chemical manufacturing rule will help reduce pollution burden for communities living near polluting facilities. And this is an important step um, for advancing environmental justice. So Moms Clean Air Force is asking for the EPA to remove exemptions for all startup shutdown and malfunction episodes at these facilities, increase the combustion efficiency and monitoring for flaring, enhance leak detection and repair protocols for all hazardous chemicals across the entire facility, and implement precedent setting fence line monitoring for six toxic air pollutants. Communities living near chemical and petrochemical facilities need the latest, most advanced fence line monitoring technologies with detection and limits and action levels that would best protect public health. All facilities covered by these rules should have fence line monitoring as a requirement connected to root cause analysis and mandatory corrective actions. So again, I strongly support the proposed chemical manufacturing rule and call on the EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities as quickly as possible. I thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'll see if the panelists have any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you. All right, so next I'm going to call um, Michael Bellevue and Maya Nye. Um, thank you. Good morning, uh, my Good morning. name is Mike Bellevue. I'm the executive director of Defend Our Health and we're a nonprofit public health and social justice organization. 
Um, I was trained in environmental science at MIT, and I have more than 40 years of experience in chemical hazard assessment and prevention policy. Uh, this proposed rule is long overdue and a major step in the right direction. However, it falls far short of the administration's commitment to environmental justice or even the requirements of the Clean Air Act. Uh, the rule must be further amended to require all available control technologies to further reduce fugitive emissions of hazardous air pollutants from leaking equipment. First, um, the proposed rule fails to provide for an ample margin of safety. Under EPA's pre precedent setting uh, benzene decision, uh, EPA must quote, strive to provide maximum feasible protection by protecting the greatest number of pe persons possible to an individual lifetime risk level no higher than approximately one in one million, end quote. EPA determined an ample margin of safety in the benzene decision that was much more health protective than under today's proposed rule. Uh, consider, for example, the number of people who face residual cancer risk after the rule is adopted greater than one in one million. Under the benzene rule, that's 0 0.1 million people. But under this proposed rule, 5.7 million people would still face such serious cancer risk, 57 times higher. In fact, the rule only reduces that population at risk by 21%. Consider the population protected to less than the one in a million cancer risk level. Under the benzene rule, 99% of the surrounding population was so protected, but under this rule, only 89% of the neighboring residents would be protected. And consider the cancer incidence left after rule adoption. Under the benzene rule, the cancer incidence was reduced to 0.04 cases per year, but under this proposed rule, the cancer incidence would be 10 times higher at 0.44. Further, uh, these uh, already high residual cancer risks are seriously understated for two reasons. One, uh, fugitive emissions uh, from leaking equipment are much higher than EPA estimates. And two, um, EPA failed to account for the projected doubling in plastics production in the next decade, which is what is driving the majority of chemical plant emissions that are subject to this rule. My second point is that the proposed rule violates the administration's commitment to environmental justice. EPA has done a good job at identifying environmental justice concerns, but really a terrible job at addressing this injustice. After adoption of this proposed rule, assuming it wasn't weakened, 64% of the population still burdened by residual cancer risk would be people of color compared to the national average of about 40%. That's 1.6 million brown and black people who live within 10 kilometers of a chemical plant. EPA must also address other health factors, which they've not done yet, such as the unique susceptibility of people of color due to the cumulative impacts with other risk factors, such as racism, poverty, lack of access to health care and healthy food and more. And there's ample science to review in this regard. Lastly, um, the proposed rule must be amended to require available control technologies to further reduce fugitive emissions from leaking equipment. The proposed rule fails to require three proven control technologies. One is leakless equipment, such as zero emission valves and pumps already required, for example, at California oil refineries. Existing facilities should be required to retrofit with leakless equipment during turnarounds. Second, um, optical gas imaging, which can readily detect invisible plumes of leaking chemicals and is also being advanced for air pollution control in California. And third, automatic leak detection sensor networks. If we can outfit our own homes with smart appliances, why can't the chemical plants be outfitted to do the same for comprehensive monitoring of leaks for timely correction? In conclusion, um, EPA must strengthen this rule to further reduce emissions of hazardous air pollutants from the chemical industry in order to provide an ample margin of safety as required by the Clean Air Act and to ensure that environmental just, justice concerns are fully addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to check and see at this point if the speakers, um, I, I, excuse me, the panelists have any clarifying questions. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're, we're gonna move on to um, Ms. Maya Nye. 
Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Maya Nye. I'm the Federal Policy Director for Coming Clean, a collaborative network of around 150 health, environmental, fence line community, scientific, and other organizations and experts that are working to transform the or chemical industry so that they're no longer a source of harm. We're guided by the vision of a safe, healthy, and just environment outlined in the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals. And we recommend that the EPA look to the charter and accompanying policy papers at louisvillecharter.org for guidance in developing rules to achieve the agency's mission. But today, I'm primarily speaking to you as someone who grew up on the fence line right across the river from the chemical manufacturing complex in Institute, West Virginia, which was identified by the 2018 National Air Toxics Assessment as the census block having the highest cancer risk in West Virginia from hazardous air pollution. My family still lives in the house where I grew up, as they have for more than 40 years. And while this rule covers Altivia, one of the multitude of facility owners at the Institute site, which, as uh, my colleague Lucia Valentine mentioned, is located in the historically Black community of Institute, uh, changes proposed to this rule won't drastically reduce the cancer risk for my community because this rule doesn't apply to the source that is actually driving the high cancer risk in my home community. And frankly, that's what I care about because there's no acceptable cancer risk for my community or any other community. EPA really needs to take a more holistic approach across the siloed regulatory framework to look at how these rules function as a group to reduce community cancer risk. So since this rule won't really do much for addressing environmental justice concerns in my community, I'm here in solidarity with those who are adversely and disproportionately experiencing health harming pollution from these source categories. Um, so this rule does take some positive steps that we support, including the elimination of exemptions for startup and shutdown malfunction periods, improved leak detection and repair, uh, pairing fence line monitoring with corrective action, and we support using the best and most current available science and EPA's reliance on the iris risk value for ethylene oxide. However, EPA can and must go further. Require fence line monitoring and the maximum leak detection and repair strategies at all facilities. Ensure that action levels are low enough to be meaningfully protective of health using data for chronic inhalation exposure develop and implement technologies to detect chemicals in real time at the levels at which they actually propose harm. Make information available in all of the languages spoken by impacted communities. And as well, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the disparate public facing attention that EPA has given to the multiple different NESHAPs rules regulating hazardous air emissions and to the communities affected by them. Public engagement on the ethylene oxide sterilizers rule was a step in the right direction, and that should be considered as the floor for what is repeated across other rules. Action is long overdue for Institute and many other communities disproportionately experiencing high cancer risk and other harmful health effects from hazardous air pollution, including developmental, neurotoxic, reproductive, and endocrine disrupting harms. EPA must not delay justice any further for our communities, and EPA must issue proposed rule, uh, proposed changes to the polyether polyols, chemical manufacturing area sources, and hospital sterilizer source categories as soon as possible before the end of this summer. We have been waiting for far too long, and this action must be taken soon enough for my elders who are still living to benefit from their protections. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you. Oh, panelists, any questions for you? Okay, thank you. All right, so the next two speakers we have are Ms. Catherine Super and Ms. Sarah uh, Bucic. And I really apologize if I didn't say that correctly. Um, so um, Ms. Super, um, if you'll please begin, thank you. Hi there, thank you. Um, my name is Katie Super, and I work for the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, or EJHA. 
EJHA works in service and in solidarity with communities who are impacted by legacy exposure and ongoing pollution of toxic chemicals. The communities we serve are located across the country and many live near multiple chemical facilities, many of which are harm regulated sites. It is encouraging to see the elimination of startup shutdown and malfunction exemptions, the increased error monitoring in this role, and as well as improving leak detection and repair for the ETO and chloroprint facilities. While these improvements are important steps to protect communities and workers, they need to be expanded upon in the crucial window of this administration to reach its environmental justice goals and proactively protect communities. The Han role as it stands is still not enough to address the disproportionate health impacts on communities of color and low income, and low income communities living on the fence line of petrochemicals. EPA's community risk and demographic assessments show that even with these stronger regulations, thousands of people will still be at unacceptable cancer risk. For the pretension of harm and to apply the best and swiftest corrective action possible, leak detection and repair as well as fence line monitoring requirements should be expanded to all facilities covered under these rules. EPA should use the best available science to understand health risks and require the best currently available monitoring technology at all facilities along with real-time monitoring data and notification of unsafe air pollution levels. EPA should provide clear information and communication with translation available in all languages spoken by our impacted communities. My friends on the fence line do not live in a vacuum of each pollutant from each source. The cumulative view of burden needs to be addressed with maximum prevention enacted and corrective action taken as swiftly as possible. While the current regulatory structure does not take a holistic approach, the EPA can tighten standards within each of these siloed rules to reduce pollution and the health burden in our communities. Um, the key driving sentiment here is that the only acceptable health risk is zero. And EPA should be striving towards that goal with every possible rule, every action, and every step it's taking. I look forward to seeing the most robust, encompassing, and protective home rule, and we'll be submitting comments in writing, and I'm very willing and help, ready to help EPA achieve this at the swiftest possible, possible timeline. Um, thank you so much for letting me speak today, and I am available if you need me. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, panelists. Okay, thank you. All right, our next speaker, please. Good morning, uh, thank you. My name is Sarah Bucic and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this proposal. I'm here today representing the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and I've been a registered nurse for over 20 years. Uh, our group, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments is the only national nursing organization focused solely on the intersection of health and the environment. And we are requesting the swift adoption of EPA's proposed standards, which would dramatically reduce air toxics related cancer risks for people who live near approximately 200 plants across the country that make these synthetic organic chemicals. We applaud EPA's proposed rule, which if implemented will provide critical health protections by reducing emissions of hazardous air pollutants, including the highly toxic chemical ethylene oxide. The Clean Air Act lists ETO as a hazardous air pollutant, and despite its wide usage, EPA National Toxicology Program and the International Association of Research on Cancer all classify ETO as a carcinogen. We know that chronic exposure through inhaling ETO is associated with the development of cancers of white blood cells, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as breast cancer. We know that children are really susceptible and vulnerable. Their bodies experience frequent cell divisions as they grow, and they're really susceptible to the DNA mutations caused by ETO exposure. And we know acute inhalation can also contribute to respiratory issues, headaches, nausea, vomiting, fatigue. According to the EPA estimates, the biggest risk reductions in these proposed regulations would result from cutting the ETO emissions at eight specific chemical plants that currently pose the highest risk to surrounding communities in Texas and Louisiana. When fully implemented, this proposal reduce, would reduce over 6,000 tons of toxic air toxics a year from the plants in Texas and Louisiana. And this rule would reduce 23,500 tons of smog forming VOCs a year. And it would add in protections for people who live near these ETO emitting facilities and would increase fence line monitoring. And it would also help around anybody using, producing, storing, or emitting any of the six air toxics. 
Our group supports this proposal um, and as nurses prioritizing the health of patients and communities, we do continue to encourage EPA to strengthen ethylene oxide emissions at these ETO emitting facilities. We want EPA to ensure that risk reviews uh, continue to include margins of safety to protect public health and include environmental justice analysis and look at cumulative risks and hazards. We also would like EPA to improve enforcement, monitoring, and accountability and remove any loopholes that allow periodic uncontrolled emissions from industry processes. And we also would like to see an increase in penalties for emitting facilities that continuously fail to comply with Clean Air Act standards. We don't believe that corporations should be able to treat penalties as a normal cost of doing business. In addition to improving fence line monitoring and the proposed standards, we'd like to see there be more enforcement around fence lines of all source categories of ETO because we believe workers and communities need and deserve strong protections. And we would also like to continue to see EPA communicating risks to communities and specifically uh, with this proposal to facility workers and around these high risk facilities and look at cumulative air pollution exposures. We also would like to see EPA um, continue and increase their language access because a lot of these facilities are in areas where English is not the first language. And we would also like to see EPA continue working toward a complete phase out of ETO. As nurses, uh, we're always prioritizing the health of patients and communities, and we believe no one's ability to breathe clean air should depend on race, income, or language. And we urge EPA to swiftly adopt the strongest, most um, uh, the strongest version of these proposed standards to protect health and safety. We appreciate being able to content um, to comment on today's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, panelists, questions for you. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to call on the next two speakers. Uh, first, we'll have Mr. Brendan Mascarenas and then Ms. Cindy Lee. So um, Mr. Mascarenas, if you would please join us. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thanks again uh, for the opportunity to, to provide a, a public statement today on EPA's uh, proposal. Uh, my name is Brendan Mascarenas. I'm a, a senior director with the American Chemistry Council, representing some of the chemical manufacturers that are impacted by the proposed standards. Um, we would just note uh, as, as a couple of um, of the items that we've flagged as, as part of our initial review of the, of the proposal, um, there are a number of significant issues that impact uh, the, the facilities uh, covered under the, the scope of EPA's proposed requirements. Um, a, a number of the actions in EPA's proposal extend across uh, both NESHAP and new source performance standards, representing uh, six separate rulemakings in, in one effort. Um, it does take a, some bit of time to assess the impact associated with each of those rulemakings. Um, so as part of uh, EP, uh, ACC's analysis in that, we are requesting uh, an additional uh, time to comment on the proposal, um, and we'll be uh, submitting a letter to that effect for EPA's consideration. Uh, but we did want to note in, in, in our interim analysis that uh, we we flag that EPA has elected to conduct a risk assessment as part of this rulemaking um, and its updates to the NESHAP standards. Um, that represents a, a voluntary decision on EPA's part that expands the scope of the requirements and some of the technical issues that, that are associated with them. Um, in the risk assessment, there's an extensive modeling that, that EPA has provided as the basis for its conclusion um, that risks are unacceptable for the top sources in, in the category. Uh, based on our initial analysis, there may be some errors in what uh, EPA's modeling files show and things like covered facility um, or emissions estimates that, that may be outdated or, uh, or, or inaccurate for what uh, current emissions are uh, that have been lowered or uh, failing to account for new control technologies as part of the industry. Um, so we do have a, a, a set of uh, considerations and updates for EPA's uh, comment process that we'll be filing to, to the docket. But again, um, it, it takes a bit of time for uh, for, for a full and, and comprehensive analysis. Um, in addition, uh, EPA's uh, position in the, in the risk analysis does preclude it from uh, considering costs, but we, uh, as part of our industry's consideration of what the proposed requirements are, we're doing an analysis of, of what that impact looks like as well um, for some of the, the, the key requirements. We'd also note as part of the uh, EPA's package, the ethylene oxide requirements are significantly stringent. Um, in, in fact, uh, un unprecedented for a previous rulemaking. Um, we're working diligently to assess the impact and evaluate the feasibility of those requirements. Uh, but our initial analysis shows that there may be some technical challenges associated 
with obtaining accurate measurements for things like uh, the, the defense line program um, in ways that properly account for what background concentrations may be. Um, in the fence line monitoring program, the, the specific uh, HAP that, that are targeted in as, as part of the monitoring requirements um, all represent a, an unprecedented regulatory requirement um, that has not previously been imposed. And so, uh, again, we're taking some time to evaluate the, the, the impact of the program and uh, providing uh, further detail in our comments, but wanted to, to note that uh, we'll be following up on some of these initial concerns in our written comment package to EPA. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. And now I'll ask the panelists if they have any clarifying questions. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Lee. Hi, good morning. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Lay. I am 20 years old and I'm speaking to you all today. Uh, as a private citizen of Allegheny County, as well as on behalf of the Action for the Climate Emergency, where I serve on the Youth Advisory Board. I'd like to thank this committee for allowing me the platform to speak as a resident of the Steel City, Pittsburgh. We place in the top 10 most polluted cities in America for particle pollution, and Allegheny County ranks in the top 1% of counties in the U.S. at risk for cancer for air pollution. Nearly half of our pollution comes from industrial polluters who continually prove that they cannot operate safely and ethically under state and federal regulations. Though the greater Ohio River Valley area falls victim to a plethora of these corporate petrochemical polluters, I want to bring to your attention the gross negligence demonstrated by the Shell ethylene cracker plant in Beaver County to emphasize the necessity of strong emission regulations on petrochemical facilities. Current regulations allow the plant to emit 2.2 million tons of, of CO2 and CO2 equivalents per year, which is equal to putting more than 430,000 passenger cars on the road for a full year. It will take nearly 2 million acres of trees to capture year, each year's worth of CO2 emissions from the cracker plant, which is equal to 6.5% of the total area of Pennsylvania, or just under 12% of all of Pennsylvania's forest coverage. This year, the plant received their third violation notice for surpassing emission limits. In a year-long period ending in September, volatile organic compound emissions reached 521.6 tons, exceeding the 516.2 ton limit the, Dep the Department of Environmental Protection placed. You would think appropriate measures would be taken to scale back emissions, especially after being notified three times, but in fact, the cracker plant's emissions only scaled up in size, releasing 662.9 tons of VOCs in October, 716.6 tons in November, and in December, 741.5 tons of volatile organic compounds and 345.4 tons of nitrogen oxide. These VOCs and nitrogen oxides, we know, react to create ground-level smog, making breathing difficult and posing short and long-term health risks, risks like heart and lung disease, asthma, cancer, other chronic illnesses uh, that are especially vulnerable to low-income communities of color. Like so many residents in Pittsburgh, I am tired of waking up and checking the air quality index to see that we're in the red zone for the third time this week and breathing in air that I know is actively making me sick. Enough is enough. Petrochemical facilities like the Shell Cracker Plant will continue to ignore emission regulations unless firm action is taken. Our health and well-being rides on the outcome of this proposal, which is why I must urge the EPA to place the strictest possible regulations on these industrial polluters that threaten the health and well-being of our communities, that refuse to take accountability for their actions, and that prevent us from reaching our goals for a sustainable and equitable world. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Panelists, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, so our next two speakers are Erandi Trevino and Gilad Shipser. So, um, Ms. Trevino, if you would please begin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Randy Trevino, and I'm the Texas State Organizer for Moms Clean Air Force and their Latino Outreach Program, Ecomadres. I live in Houston, surrounded by many of the roughly 80 facilities covered by the proposed chemical manufacturing rule. 
Today, I am here to call on the EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities to protect, to protect the health of community members living nearby. We know that the petrochemical industry creates a significant climate warming greenhouse gas pollution while simultaneously releasing a host of toxic pollution known to impact health. According to an EPA analysis, the demographic makeup of communities near the plants covered under the chemical manufacturing proposal found a higher than average percentage of residents were African American, low income, and or Hispanic or Latino. My neighborhood in Southeast Houston sits next to the Houston Ship Channel, which is packed with chemical plants and refineries. It is located next to municipalities such as Deer Park that often see violations. Most recently, the Shell Deer Park chemical facility that caught fire had a record of 1946 violations over the past decade. That's close to 2000 in 10 years including releases of toxic chemicals such as I-3-butadine, this facility is currently in high priority violation of the Clean Air Act with 12 of the last 12 orders in non-compliance. There are 95 violations still active today, including the failure to properly control gases venting from equipment. This facility, this facility has a long track record of failure to properly control gases venting from equipment. And it has a long track record of non-compliance and toxic pollution releases, and it is not far from the ITC Deer Park facility that caught fire in 2019, releasing benzene and incurred 27 violations since that last disaster. That's 27 violations in four years after a disaster that disrupted an entire community right around Thanksgiving. The effects on our health from all these toxic pollution releases are cumulative. A lot of them stay in our bodies year after year, and we just collect more as we go along. This makes communities central to this rule. Making communities central to this rule would be an important step forward. Moms support EPA's efforts to analyze air toxic risks at the community level that considers cumulative cumulative toxic emissions of nearby polluters. I encourage EPA to link the findings in the community risk assessment more directly to the regulatory requirements in the rule. Also, implementation of fence line monitoring for six toxic air pollutions, air, air pollutants, including benzene and I3-butadine for all facilities, along with detection limits and action levels that are protective of human health. This is crucial. Air pollution from chemical and petrochemical facilities can increase risk of numerous health issues. It can cause cancer and raise the risk of respiratory, neurological, cardiovascular, and reproductive issues. As someone who suffers from several chronic health issues, I know the poor health can feel like a knee on our neck that can not only hold us back, but cause misery. Moms support the removal of exemptions from all startup shutdown and malfunction episodes at these facilities so that the companies are no longer allowed to release unlimited amounts of toxic chemicals during these times. The Gulf Coast has progressively seen more storms and Harris County has experienced some of the highest rates of climate weather events in the entire country. In the last few years, my mother's home flooded with Hurricane Harvey and my mom was, and my home was later damaged during winter storm Uri. We are really struggling just to catch up from the last, and to recover from the last disaster. One day these disasters are gonna come so frequently that we won't be able to recover. It is unconscionable that companies get a free pass to pollute when families are struggling again and again to recover. I'm urging the EPA to finalize the manufacturing rule to protect families and children. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that, Ms. Trevino. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind, um, we, we had a little bit of technical difficulty there for the last um, probably 20 seconds of your statement. If you wouldn't mind just, um, just repeating that last part that, that you shared with us. Yes, of course. Um, so is it okay if I just like the last 30 seconds or so? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I think I only missed the very, very last um, part there. Okay. Um, Mom support the removal of exemptions for all startup shutdown and malfunction episodes at these facilities. So companies are no longer allowed to release unlimited amounts of toxic chemicals during these times. The Gulf Coast has progressively seen more storms and Harris County has experienced some of the highest rates of climate weather events in the entire country. In the last few years, my mother's home flooded with Hurricane Harvey and my home saw damage from winter storm Yuri. Extreme weather events have resulted in a spike of, spike of emissions and flaring, which causes my health to flare up. And then not only are we struggling to recover from our health, but we're also struggling to recover financially. The EPA should require the phase out of open flame stack flares and mom support increased combustion efficiency and monitoring for flaring, including continuous emission monitoring for the flaring stacks. And just lastly, it is unconscionable that companies get a free pass to pollute when families are struggling to recover time and time again. I am urging the EPA to finalize a strong chemical manufacturing rule to protect families and children. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, um, panelists, do you have any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you so much for that, Ms. Trevino, and for bearing with us on <laughs> our technical difficulties. All right. Um, next, I want to ask, um, is it, is it Gilad Schitzer? Yeah, good morning. Okay. Thank you, please, please begin. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a good session uh, until now. My name is Gilad Spitzer. I'm an air pollution measurement expert. I run uh, three companies, source testing group uh, that does the sampling. I run also analytical laboratory that does the analysis. And I also run a, a, what we call a, a, real-time things like monitoring system as an integration company, uh, the same things that we do in California. So I want to, to give you some facts about what technology are out there uh, that can be uh, cost-effective, uh, better, I think, than uh, what you proposed in the rule. So the first thing I would like to say is today, there is technology that make it possible to continuously uh, measure and report all target uh, compounds simultaneously, all the six compounds that the law is talking about, and a dozen more uh, you cannot be added uh, without audit cost. All of that will be based on official EPA method called TO16. If uh, uh, the law now talk about TO15, it's a canister, or the passive tube is something similar to TO17. In between, there is an EPA method called TO16, that allows you to measure all gaseous uh, using one instrument that's called open path FTIR and with cost effective way. I read your uh, uh, calculation about how much it would cost to the industry. And it looks like uh, implementing real time monitoring using open path FTIR uh, will lower the cost dramatically. Uh, and if we are talking during five years operation, based on the number that you reported, average facility will uh, uh, spend something like uh, $3 million over five years using a real-time monitoring technology uh, that you will have a minute-by-minute -minute results, uh, uh, alerting options, public websites, uh, monitoring all the surrounding of the facility, you are talking about around just one, one and a half million during uh, five years operation. And that uh, 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 
very good reduce of money and getting much more uh, for the same money. Real time is the basis uh, uh, for reducing the emission. The EPA understand it, everybody in the world now understand it. The most critical issue on reducing the emission is finding the problem faster. If we do a, a, a measurement every week, so uh, we can emit six days or in average three days until we find the leak. If we are measuring uh, 24 seven, then it's the most efficient way to uh, reduce the emission. And I got one more minute, so I will say uh, there is experience. There is three years operation in California. All the refinery must measure 20 compounds simultaneously, report to the public on real-time basis, uh, uh, and alert the public if there is exceedances. So it, it can be done, it's cheaper, and it will give the, all the stakeholders all the advantages. Um, I think with that, I will end and I will uh, put my comments in writing and all my calculations so you can follow them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, panelists, do you have questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so before I call the next um, speakers, um, I do want to just remind um, um, people that as you come forward to present um, your comments, if you would please um, spell your name so that we can accu accurately capture that um, in, in the um, 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 write-up that the court reporter is, is doing um, for this hearing today. So thank you very much. And with that, I am going to now ask Ms. Um, Takesha Collins Wright um, to speak next. And then after um, uh, Ms. Collins Wright, we'll hear from um, Ms. Louise Hetzler. So please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. That was perfect the way you said it. Uh, Takesha Collins Wright, uh, Takesha is spelled T O K E S. H A Collins Wright, C O L L I N S W R I G H T. Uh, thank you. I'm Takesha Collins Wright. I'm the Vice President of Environmental Affairs for the Louisiana Chemical Association, LCA. And we appreciate the opportunity to comment during this public forum on the proposed amendments. Uh, LCA also plans to submit detailed written comments by the deadline, but we're taking the opportunity today to provide summary remarks. Uh, LCA is a nonprofit Louisiana corporation composed of more than 65 member companies uh, with over 100 chemical manufacturing plant sites in Louisiana. Um, nearly all LCA member companies operate at least one facility in Louisiana that is subject to the proposed amendments. Uh, LCA supports EPA's measures in improving to improve the air quality in Louisiana. Indeed, LCA members have made significant investments to reduce emissions of both criteria and hazardous air pollutants over the last three decades. As a result, hazardous and toxic air pollutant emissions have significantly decreased over this period. Um, however, LCA is concerned with the basis of EPA's risk assessment um, in the proposed amendments the proposal today. LCA, we first comment that EPA's re-review of its prior risk evaluation under Section 112 is unnecessary. Uh, second, uh, that EPA is continuing to rely on a risk value, a risk level for ethylene oxide EO that is underdeveloped and is inappropriate for use in the rulemaking. Uh, regarding EPA's repeated risk analysis, the Clean Air Act only requires that a technology review, review be updated every eight years. Under Section 112, only a single residual risk analysis must be performed eight within must be performed eight years after the rule is initially adopted. Um, EPA acknowledges this in the proposed amendments, noting here that there is no statutory obligation for EPA to conduct a second residual risk review of the Han or the standards for affected sources producing neoprene subject to PNRI. Um, LCA further comments that the appropriateness of the use of the iris value, uh, values for regulatory purposes and scientific credibility of the values themselves have been consistently called into question without being meaningfully addressed by um, the EPA. 
EPA's use of the revised iris risk values, derived risk values for ethylene oxide and chloroprene in the proposal has led to overestimates of both the SOCNY source and whole facility risk values for Louisiana facilities with these emissions. In conclusion, LCA members remain fully committed to reducing emissions and keeping Louisiana prosperous and ensuring it is a safe and healthy place to live. LCA does request that, however, that EPA use scientifically driven data and methods in order to further regulation and that the EPA fully address industry IRS value concerns before basing regulatory action on those values. LCA looks forward to continuing to work with EPA on these important issues through this middle, again, of our written comments. Thank you. Thank you. Panelist questions? Okay, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn to Ms. Louise Hetzler. Please begin, Hi. thank you. And, and please spell your name, thank you. Yes, my name is Louise Ina Hetzler. Louise, L-O-U-I-S-E, Ina, I-N-A, Hetzler, H-E-T-Z-L-E-R. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today. I am a trained climate reality leader with the Climate Reality Project. Um, I'm also a member of Mothers Out Front and a concerned citizen, grandmother, and environmentalist. I'm also a songwriter and I write environmental songs and I'm gonna share a song today called Take Care of the Planet, which I wrote in 1992. Just thinking about the planet and what we used to take for granted clean water and air used to be everywhere now the world's in disrepair and how many of us care or are even aware of the damage that's been done to the earth and everyone now there's no place to run. Let's make this the decade of the planet and save what we used to take for granted. Clean water and air can be everywhere if we each do our share. We haven't that much time to spare to accomplish this repair before our fate is sealed walk among the flowers in the field and feel earth's prayer to be healed thank you very much thank you Panelists, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Okay, I'm gonna call the next two speakers, um, Ms. Jane Williams and then Ms. Bertosh Sager. So Ms. Williams, if you'll please um, join us, thank you. Uh, Penny, I do not see Jane Williams responding at the moment. So maybe if Tosh is ready, we can. Move okay, to Tosh. we'll go on and then we'll circle back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sager, are you present? Thank you. Please begin. Um, I, I can't hear you. Um, I, I believe you're muted. 
Um, yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Thanks. Good, good afternoon. My name is Tosh Soccer. I'm a senior attorney at Earth Justice, um, and I'm here today to comment on EPA's rather appalling failure to meet its obligations to regulate emissions of 1-bromopropane, also known as 1-BP, from sources covered by this rule. Um, it's pretty clear from EPA's own data that covered sources do use and emit 1-BP, and therefore EPA must regulate 1-BP in this rulemaking. As a bit of background, 1-BP was not part of the HAP list enacted by Congress. Instead, over a decade ago, a number of petitioners submitted ample evidence to EPA that 1-BP is a highly toxic air pollutant and that EPA needed to list it as a HAP. But EPA engaged in years of unlawful foot dragging until 2022, when EPA finally added 1-BP to the HAP list. In listing 1-BP, EPA acknowledged that the chemical is likely carcinogenic, it's a powerful neurotoxicant, and it's a reproductive toxicant. Uh, because 1BP was not listed as a HAP until 2022, the existing standards for these sources do not satisfy EPA's legal obligations under the Clean Air Act to regulate 1BP. EPA's prior rulemakings for the covered source categories all predate the listing of 1BP, and therefore EPA has never set max standards for this chemical. Accordingly, under the DC Circuit's decision in lean, EPA is required to calculate the MAC floors and set MAC standards for 1BP in this rulemaking. EPA's proposal does not do so. Instead, it relies on factual misstatements to duck its legal responsibilities. EPA states that it does not have information showing that 1BP is, quote, used, produced, or emitted at sources covered by the Han, PNR1, or PNR2 standards. But based, and based on that misstatement, EPA says, we believe there is no further action required by EPA to address 1BP emissions. But that is not true, and it's flatly contradicted by TRI data and CDR data. To take just one example, TRI data, which again is EPA's own data, shows that a single facility emits tens of thousands of pounds of 1BP every year. And that's the Albemarle plant in Magnolia, Arkansas, it's listed um, on the list of covered um, plants that are as part of the docket. EPA's TRI database shows tens of thousands of pounds of 1BP emitted every year. And that's EPA's own data, and it completely eviscerates EPA's stated rationale in the proposal for not regulating 1BP in this rulemaking. However, EPA came to such a false and erroneous conclusion, there can be no question that today, EPA is now on notice of its error and of the need to address 1BP in this rulemaking in a manner consistent with its obligations under lean, which again, require EPA to calculate the MAC floor for 1BP and to set standards for 1BP. Yeah, I wanna sort of step back and say, we've heard today from multiple people who have suffered or died from years of inaction on chemicals like ETO and chloroprene from, this, from these sources. And what you are doing on 1BP is starting to make the exact same mistake. You're short circuiting your legal obligations uh, for whatever reason, don't. My time today is short, so I'm not gonna offer specific suggestions on how EPA should proceed. Instead, what I would say is EPA must immediately begin a dialogue with impacted and communities and advocates in order to develop a path for remedying this unlawful conduct. Thank you. Um, do the panelists have any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna check again and see um, if Ms. Jane Williams um, is present. Oh, yes, good. Well, I guess it's good afternoon. Um, Ms. Williams, if you'll please begin. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Jane Williams, J-A-N-E-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Um, I chair the Sierra Club National Clean Air Team, and I'm the Executive Director of California Communities Against Toxics. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, thank you so much for redoing the F2 analysis. We 
had requested that because of the new iris values for ethylene oxide. And I just want to um, you know, thank the administration for doing this reanalysis and for adopting more protective standards for ethylene oxide in the detection and repair section of the proposed rules. Um, as you can see, um, when we look at these compounds that are being emitted from facilities um, and the risk is updated, uh, we change our behavior and our decisions and our regulatory pathways. And so I, I just want to point that out to the agency as a matter of public policy and say that if we did that for other sentinel compounds, um, like Tosh was saying, 1BP, which the agency has a duty to regulate. Um, 1BP is incredibly toxic. It's persistent biocumulative toxin. It's in the breast milk and core blood of almost every human on the planet. It is akin to PCBs or DDT or other compounds that we've banned through the Stockholm Convention. Um, we get better regulatory outcomes. And so the major points that I want to address in just these few moments is that the LDAR requirements, the leak detection and repair requirements for ethylene oxide that the agency is proposing to adopt in this rule after a lengthy scientific process, lengthy scientific process that has gone on now for over 25 years, right? Um, the NIOSH study looking at the public health impacts on workers and sterilization plants across the country um, was published in 2002, the results of that, showing a host of um, health problems and workers that are being exposed to ethylene oxide. So this is not new science, it's not controversial science, it's actually some of the best science that we can produce as our society, looking at the, the public health impacts of ethylene oxide. Those same requirements that we're looking at in the leak detection and repairs for ethylene oxide, we need to adopt that sector wide. We need to do this for a bunch of different reasons that I just wanna quickly uh, talk about. And that is that um, I, I saw uh, Dr. Nye uh, from Environmental Justice Health Alliance, which is also very focused on chemical disaster rules. And what the Chemical Safety Board finds over and over again when it goes and does its investigations after chemical disasters um, is that it's pieces of equipment that are failing and get red tagged by workers that then during turnarounds or during operation and maintenance don't get repaired that are very often the cause of giant chemical, chemical disasters. And so if we do a better job comprehensively on LDAR requirements, and we adopt more stringent um, monitoring requirements, such as the sensor leak detection sensor networks, um, we will programmatically solve not only the problems at the fence line, but will also help solve the chemical disaster problem. Um, and as the petrochemical infrastructure in this country ages, um, we need to find incentives for industry to make the necessary investments in time, effort, manpower, and money um, to make sure that this infrastructure is being maintained. And so um, <clears throat> I wanna thank the industry, I wanna thank the, um, the agency for redoing the risk analysis. I would like to see um, a ramping between what we found in the risk analysis and how we underpin the actual regulatory superstructure to require the reductions of the risk. I, want, I would like to see the fence line monitoring be at the lowest possible detection limits so that we can actually regulate risk at the fence line at the, at the level in which it is causing the risk. And I would also like to see the fence line monitoring your, your big six list um, expanded to make sure that we have fence line monitoring requirements at every facility that's covered by the rule. And here's why. The Beaver plant, which is not covered by the rule, is currently not operating. And one of the reasons it's not operating is because it has fence line monitoring for benzene and hexane, toluene, and a couple other compounds. And it basically has exceeded that, that speed limit. And so without the fence line monitoring, we don't know how the control strategies that we've adopted inside the facilities are actually operating. The fence line monitoring is, it's a speed limit at the fence line that forces facility managers to actually manage to that metric. 
which is very important to protect fence line communities and keep equipment upgraded. So um, with that, I look forward to continuing to work with the agency to strengthen the rule and to um, protect fence line communities, which we all know are primarily environmental justice communities. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Okay, thank you very, very, very much. Um, panelists, do you have any uh, questions? Okay, thank you. All right, so the time is now um, 12.15. So I am going to call a five minute break and we will continue the hearing um, um, at 12.20. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Hello, and welcome back from the break. Um, my name is Penny Lassiter, and again, I'm the Director of the Sector Policies and Programs Division here at EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards uh, within the Office of Air and Radiation. Uh, for those of you um, recently joining, I am chairing the session um, of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. Again, joining me um, are, are two um, members um, of EPA, and I'm going to ask um, each of those panelists to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Njeri Muller, and I'm an engineer in EPA's Sector Policies and Programs Division. Hi everyone, my name is Johanna Klein and I'm an environmental engineer also in the sector and policies and programs division. Okay, thank you. I want to remind you that today's hearing is being recorded and transcribed to produce a written transcript of the hearing. We'll add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. For those of you on Zoom, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us via the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing pound nine. Our logistics team will add you to today's agenda if there are any time slots available. If you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our registration support team. You'll find that email address in the public hearing box on our website located at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. Please note that by registering for this event, you agree to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. That includes the rules of behavior shown here. EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images or sustained disruption of the public hearing event. EPA expects all participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. As a quick reminder about providing testimony, when I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. While you are providing testimony, you're welcome to activate your camera by clicking on the start video icon. Please state and spell your name for the record. A four minute timer will start when you're, uh, once you state your name. So at this point, I'd like to invite our next two speakers who are, um, Brooke Petrie and Laura Placenia. So, Ms. Petrie, if you would please begin. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Brooke Petrie. It's B R O O K E P E T R Y. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm a state coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, and I live in Philadelphia with my family. I strongly support the proposed chemical manufacturing rule and call on EPA to finalize the most protective and comprehensive standards possible. There are two facilities in Pennsylvania that will be covered by the EPA's proposed rule. One of them, Advanced 6, is located here in Philadelphia, about seven miles from my front door. The compliance status for Advanced 6 is listed at high priority violation, and the facility was out of compliance for 11 of the last 12 quarters. 
The petrochemical industry creates a significant climate warming greenhouse gas pollution while simultaneously releasing a host of toxic pollu pollution known to impact health. As a person with asthma and as the parent of an asthmatic child, the real impact of polluted air is truly never far from my mind. There is no fear quite like watching your child struggle to breathe and knowing that you may not be able to help them. Children are especially vulnerable to petrochemical air pollution since their bodies are still developing and because children breathe in more air for their size than adults. Breathing in more air can mean breathing in more air pollution. So knowing that, I want you to picture the area where the non-compliant Advance 6 facility is located. Within one mile, you will find a rec center, two playgrounds, and four schools. Think about what these children are breathing into their little lungs on their walks to and from school or while playing at the park with friends. Add to that the fact that the childhood asthma rate in Philadelphia is a staggering 21%. Children living near this facility need the EPA to propose and enforce the strongest possible protections so that they have a fair chance at a healthy life. The Advanced 6 facility, like many of its kind, is located where the majority of residents are people of color and low wealth. In the shadow of I-95 and having borne a disproportionate burden of air pollution for generations, this community is deserving of strong protection from the hazardous chemicals being spewed into their air. I support EPA's first ever efforts to analyze air toxics risks at the community level that consider the cumulative toxic emissions of nearby polluters. And I encourage the EPA to link those findings in the community risk assessment more directly to the regulatory requirements in the rule. The EPA must also use the latest, most advanced monitoring technology available to protect communities. And every facility covered by these rules should have fence line monitors as a requirement. Specifically, we support the implementation of precedent setting fence line monitoring for six toxic air pollutants and we encourage EPA to lower detection limits and lower the action levels at the fence line to be more protective of people's health. With ever strengthening storms like Hurricane Ida impacting our city, I fully support the removal of exemptions for all startup shutdown and malfunction episodes at these facilities so that companies no longer get a free pass to pollute during maintenance operations, hurricanes, and other events. We need enhanced leak detection and repair protocols for all hazardous chemicals across all covered facilities. EPA needs to revise the leak standards for all toxic chemicals at all facilities to meaningfully protect the health of families and communities. Petrochemical manufacturing is one of the heaviest polluting industrial sectors in the country. I strongly support the proposed chemical manufacturing rule and I call on EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities that are harming people's health and heating our climate. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm gonna call Ms. Laura Placentia. Okay, please, please begin. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Laura Placencia, L-A-U-R-A. -A. Um, I am a community organizer from Valley Improvement Projects, which is a nonprofit working on social and environmental justice in Central California. Um, and I am here um, today. Um, I want to thank you so much for the space and for the opportunity to provide my comment on these issues. Um, the mission of the EPA is to protect human health and the environment, and the purpose is to ensure that all Americans, regardless of color, race, or background, experience the same protective laws and experience clean air and water, and they must be provided with all necessary education in whatever language uh, required, given the seriousness of the uh, life impacting issues. Um, EPA's failure to revise the leak standards of the vast majority of facilities um, 
is negligent towards uh, leaks continuing to occur, considering that only six chemicals are being included in the fence line monitoring. Um, not being strict enough on leaks is ignoring potential impacts that it can have on people's health and towards um, and and in, towards its contribution towards climate change. Um, the EPA should consider the proper range of leak detection uh, technologies and should apply revised um, EPA standards uh, for all facilities. Um, I believe that only including six chemicals in the fence line monitoring is a mediocre effort um, to actually protect the people. I, I think it is a negligent act uh, towards to, uh, to not consider cumulative um, impacts of health effects of, of different toxic pollution. Um, and uh, if the EPA's intentions are truly to protect people in the environment, they should stop allowing uh, corporations to continue failing safety standards, to have exemptions or loopholes, and to um, that can impact uh, people's health and um, should um, enforce the utmost requirements to limit the emissions of toxic pollution into our communities and worsening climate issues. As a resident who owns a car, I am required to pay my registration, follow speed limits, stop stop signs, and get car insurance in case um, I get in an accident and impose damage on other people's health. Or So therefore, I don't find any excuse of why the petrochemical industry should get away from um, having failing permits, um, having... Um, not having fence line monitoring um, for for all all toxic chemicals um, that are emitted and that can pose an impact on human health. Um, these industries generate so much money they can afford to update technology. Um, I believe it is a bit of a disgrace that as a leading country in technology, we aren't doing our best to protect our people and our natural resources. Um, as demographics uh, data have shown, uh, many people that are being impacted are uh, minorities and people of color. Therefore, I believe that not including strict enough uh, regulations um, are are not caring enough about um, people's health. Um, and I believe that without any government push, um, these industries will continue to do the minimum. And that is why I urge the EPA to take action to actually protect um, the struggling communities. And thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Panelists, questions for you? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to move to the next two speakers. First of all, we'll, we'll hear from Mr. David Merritt and then from Ms. Melanie Tiller. So um, Mr. Merritt, um, yes, yes, please proceed. Uh, my, my name is Dr. David Merritt, D-A-V-I-D-M-A-R-R-E-T-T. I'm a recently retired educator and environmental scientist. Uh, currently, I'm active in leadership of the Climate Reality Project and the Sierra Club. Um, I'm very concerned, as are my organizations, about environmental justice, air pollution, environmental justice, or we, maybe we should call it environmental injustice. Um, I'm not an expert on the petrochemicals we're talking about today. So I can't really comment in any detail on those, but um, the air pollution and its effects on fence line communities are really very similar in, in a broad way. So um, I strongly support this rule. I think, of course, it could be improved, but I don't have the technical background to suggest how. So some of the things that are important, of course, are fence line monitoring as much and as frequently as possible, um, enhanced process control, better monitoring of air pollution, uh, and things like the enhanced leak detection and repair and removal removal of these um, of these rules that allow them to. Uh, have exemptions during startups and shutdowns. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, as we transition, uh, well, first of all, let me pause and just see um, if there are any um, clarifying questions from our panelists for Dr. Merritt. Okay, thank you. So um, as we transition, I just want to remind our um, audience here that the comment period for these proposed rules um, 
It is currently open. Uh, that comment period closes on June 26, 2023. Again, um, a record of your verbal testimony um, here today will be included um, in that docket, but please, um, we also encourage you to submit um, any um, written comments and materials that you have by um, that June 26 date. All right, thank you. Okay, and um, Ms. Tiller, Tiller um, if you would please proceed, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning, I'm, I'm Melanie Tiller, that's M-E-L-A-N-I-E, -E, last name Tiller, T-I-L-L-A-R. I'm a legal assistant for Environmental Integrity Project. We're a watchdog organization that focuses on anti-pollution laws. And I'm here to testify in support of the rule. Uh, I do, and we do appreciate its intention to lower the emissions of toxic chemicals and the consequential health effects in our local communities. So according to the rule, more than 75 of the affected sources will be located in Texas. A few of our plants covered under this rule are some of the worst in the state. They are no stranger to malfunctions, leaks, and accidents, all things that lead to excessive polluting, as we heard a little bit earlier. For example, Exxon's Baytown refinery, they have reported more than 1,500 tons of upset emissions over a five-year period from 2017 to 2022. Uh, these plants like Exxon Baytown, east of Houston, and Valero in Port Arthur are located less than a mile away from residential homes. And these communities are environmental justice communities, spaces that are historically known for disproportionately bearing the burden of pollution. They are communities of color, they're low income, English is usually their second or third language. Um, and all of these demographics are within the 90th percentile or higher, uh, according to EJ screen. So, you know, again, I want to thank you guys, the EPA for your action, because I, I and we do believe that this is a rule that's taking steps in the right direction by implementing practices like fence line monitoring. And it is very helpful and very impactful. Um, but though I do believe it's a step in the right direction, there is still room for improvement in this rule. And some examples that I would like to bring to our attention would be one, making fence line action levels into stronger enforceable limits, and two, improving the accuracy of emissions calculations. So my first example, as we support the proposal to require fence line monitorings. And I believe Ms. Jane Williams alluded to this earlier. We feel it's important to strengthen the action levels to include fence line limits that facilities need to be held accountable to. So in other words, there should be penalties and cleanup requirements when facilities exceed fence line limits. And the second improvement that needs to happen is there should be a more accurate emissions calculation. So the EPA uses self-reported data from facilities to estimate the harmful impacts of a source's contamination. But with a second look at this data, the data is inadequate and it lowballs the numbers of how communities are actually impacted. So we ask that the EPA take a closer look at the self-reported data in the emissions inventory and be more realistic about the impacts that these chemicals actually have on the communities. And again, fence line monitors are one source of data. So in conclusion for myself, uh, the Environmental Integrity Project would like to thank the EPA staff. Thank you all so much for your technical work on this rule. The, implement the implementation of fence line monitoring will help protect the surrounding communities. And we encourage this organization to consider holding facilities accountable through universal chemical emission limits. And by taking a realistic look at the self-reported emissions calculations listed in the emissions inventory, it will help millions of people, millions of people. There's just in Houston alone, there's three, three million people um, unseen and impacted communities for generations. So I encourage you all to look at this and thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and um, I, um, Ms. Teller, I, I did want to ask you just a clarifying question. Um, you made reference to the emissions inventory. 
Um, and I'm not sure if I understood um, whether um, your point was that there are um, emissions in there that um, we didn't use, or are you saying that um, the emissions being reported there are not um, correct? Uh, or, or were you saying something different? The latter. I believe that the emissions that are being reported are not correct if, if they're to estimate the, the hazard that it's doing to the community the, the numbers are actually lower than the calculations report so the last okay. Thing. okay thank you for clarifying that okay and now i'm going to see if the panelists have any other question questions thank okay. you guys for your thank you All right, um, moving to our next two speakers, um, I'd like to invite, um, I believe it's Miss Joe Banner and Miss Tracy Gregoire. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from um, Miss Banner. Yes, thank you. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Joe Banner. That's J-O-B-A-N-N-E-R. Um, I am a resident of Wallace, Louisiana in St. John the Baptist Parish. That is in the middle of Cantor Alley. Um, we, out of an 85 mile stretch of land, a uh, property is known as Cantor Alley. I'm actually in mile by 42 or 43. I am um, I'm commenting today because I am encouraging the strongest rules and restrictions as possible. Uh, for the petrochemical companies and for the producers of plastic. My community is suffering, as the name um, entails, from high cancer rates, some of the highest cancer rates in the country. Um, and even with this designation, we still have many of our elected officials and government agencies who, who are working on behalf of the petro petrochemical companies in order to protect them. Actually, last week I was in a, um, a hearing on the Capitol in Baton Rouge for SB 35, which was a, um, a law that would require the pet chem companies to uh, include or increase air monitoring uh, systems at their organizations, at their, their plants, um, at, a, at a cost of $18,000. This would allow LDEQ to monitor whenever there was a, um, a spill or a leak. So you weren't relying on the pet chem companies to give you that information or the, um, yeah, the different industries to give that. That bill was basically put on a burner by the committee that was hearing it. Um, and some of those committee members actually said the $18,000 would be too much for these chemicals to, uh, for these chem chemical companies to pay. Um, so if you consider that's a very small amount, um, but to see that our, our health was put as they did the rule on the back burner too. My ancestors were um, initially brought to this area about 300 years ago. They were um, enslaved to the many plantations. And what we see is that that same disregard for the health of our uh, black residents, the same as the enslaved came over for economy is being, um, is being continued today. So I just stand here, I really encourage a stronger rule as possible. I won't get here and break down all the different um, chemicals and reactions and all those different things that the scientists and doctors can explain to you. But I really just wanna encourage that we need as much help as possible. We need intervention. So many of our government officials are working hand in hand with these organizations serving as essentially what seems as an HR and a PR for these polluters. And that is really killing us. So I am just really here in support um, as strong of a uh, ruling as possible. And thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Thank you, Ms. Vanner. Um, panelists, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Next, I'm going to turn to Ms. Gregoire. I hope I said that correctly or close. You did. Thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Gregoire, um, T-R-A-C-Y-G-R-E-G-O-I-R-E. -E. Um, I am the Healthy Children Project Director for the Learning Disabilities Association of America. LDA's mission is to create opportunities for success for all individuals affected by learning disabilities through support, education, and, and action. Um, LDA's Healthy Children Project 
It works to eliminate the preventable causes, including chemical exposures and air pollution linked to learning, attention, developmental, and other neurological disorders. Um, while the medical community and the public has long understood um, that air pollution contributes to asthma and other respiratory diseases, we now know that air pollution um, um, affects children's brain health and their developing brains. Um, in 2016, a National Alliance of Scientists and Health Professionals issued a statement finding that air pollution is toxic to children's brain, developing brains and is increasing their risk for learning and developmental disorders, which are lifelong impacts. Um, mounting scientific evidence also links air pollution um, to cognitive function and reduction in children's IQ, memory, and attention. Um, I encourage the EPA, if you haven't already, to consider with these six chemicals any neurological impacts and what the um, truly um, that the health standard should be to truly protect children's health um, as well as the, the fence line um, communities and workers. Um, I think the EPA also needs to include um, cumulative impacts because we know it's not just um, um, one of these chemicals that people exposed to lots of chemicals um, from um, lots of sources. And we also need to look at synergistic effects, like more than um, what happens when um, children and these fence line communities are exposed to um, multiple chemicals at the same time. Thank you so much for this opportunity and LTA will submit written comments as well. Thank you. Panelists, do you have qu questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, moving to our next two speakers, we, we will be hearing from Ms. Julia May and M Mr. Steve Lazar. So at this point, um, Ms. May. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Julia May, um, J-U-L-I-A-M-A-Y, with Communities for a Better Environment. CBE is a California environmental justice organization uh, representing frontline communities in the Los Angeles region and Bay Area in California. These are communities of color heavily impacted and disproportionately impacted by toxic air pollution from chemical and oil industry uh, sources including Wilmington, the South Harbor area of Los Angeles with the highest concentration of refineries on the West Coast, Southeast LA with highly concentrated heavy industry, including ethylene oxide sources, Richmond, California, another heavily impacted refinery community and East Oakland, multiple sources of toxics. As an engineer, I've evaluated oil refining, petrochemical and other toxic air pollution sources at CBE for over 30 years in California, as well as consulting in other states. We appreciate EPA's efforts to reduce risk, but the remaining risk is far too high and much more can be done. For example, California has decades of regulatory mandates and experience requiring leakless technologies for fugitive, sources in refineries and, and chemical plants in the South Coast and Bay Area. Um, these should be considered the floor, not the ceiling. Um, EPA should re-review the best available technologies and lowest achievable standards used in California and throughout the nation and set the tightest standards to eliminate and minimize risks, including requiring leakless valves and, uh, and other technologies. Not only are the risks EPA is accepting to, are, um, too high already, but we know that the assumed emissions are drastically underestimated. So the risks are even higher. It's almost certain that the fugitive emissions from chemical emitting facilities are drastically underestimated, requiring tighter standards. Um, if, but even, even in California, which has tighter controls, uh, we know um, from specific studies that the emissions are far, far higher. And this is certainly true in other parts of the country. Um, this was demonstrated during specialized studies called the FluxSense studies. I'll provide you with citations in writing. 
These evaluated fugitive and other emissions using optical sensing technologies, which can directly measure emissions, not just concentrations like fence line monitoring. But uh, they, they um, found um, uh, monitoring compounds, uh, including BTEX, benzene, toluene, xylene, and ethyl benzene, that every single oil refinery in the South Coast had extremely underestimated BTEX because they were assuming the standard EPA methods uh, for fugitives and tank emissions. Um, this same broad underestimation was found in a Texas study. So this is not an anomaly. Um, they found uh, six times higher VOCs and 34 times higher benzene on average. And that was when one oil refinery was half closed. So um, that, that refinery uh, didn't show as much underestimation because part of its facilities were closed. It's almost certain the emissions would have been even higher. Um, because even the best available technologies can break down, you need to first require these best uh, technologies and leakless systems. But because they can break down, um, we also urge, urge EPA to require optical gas imaging on a weekly basis. Um, the South Coast Air Quality Management District has evaluated and is currently proposing optical gas imaging in addition to fence line monitoring and other monitoring requirements uh, to detect storage tank and fugitive emissions as a direct result of this flux sense study, which showed that their emissions inventory was, was off. Um, so in addition to tightening leak standards, this weekly OGI for the purpose of timely identifying leaking equipment is necessary, and I'll provide further citations and writing on, on that. Um, I would also like to support the important statements made earlier by uh, Mike Beliveau stating... Uh, uh, Ms. May, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up as I've got other speakers. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Uh, I, would add, I would support those comments about the need to minimize cancer risk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, panelists, do you have any questions for Ms. May? I just have one thing, Penny. Um, Ms. May, can you repeat the name of the study you referenced about OGI? Um, well, the OGI was a reference to um, uh, South Coast Sierra District regulation that I'll, I'll provide a citation on that. Those That was optical gas imaging, which is a simpler technology you can do on a weekly basis. But the earlier study, the flux set study was done by Swedish scientists in 2015 for the South Coast Air Quality Management District published in 2017. I can't remember the, um, the first author off the top of my head, but I will send you the citation. Thank you. And I'll send you the Texas one as well. Thank you for asking. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Next, I am going to um, ask Ms. Hillary, um, I believe it's Kaser, um, to please, um, uh, uh, I welcome you to speak. Um, if you would please join us. Thank you very much. Please begin. Um, Ms. Ms. Kaser, um, I cannot hear you. I believe that you're muted. I still can't hear you. Yes, Ms. Uh, Kaser, just looks like your microphone is unmuted in the Zoom system. However, you might need to confirm in the uh, Zoom microphone icon area that it's selecting the microphone you wish to speak on. Uh, in that area, there's a little uh, menu that you can select to uh, choose your microphone. So 
why don't we do this, uh, Penny? I think we also have Mr. Lazar. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, so, um, Mr. Hillary. Lazar. I'm, I will go ahead. Um, Mr. Lazar, I will go ahead and call you um, while Ms. Kaser um, is working on her audio. Um, thank you so much. Apologies for that. Thank you. Please, please begin. Um, thank you very much. My name is Stephen Lazar, and I'm an environmental consultant. I work with a company called Environmental Services and Technologies, and um, I've supported the uh, California Fence Line monitoring requirements for the past three years. So uh, Julia May's previous comments are uh, sort of a good lead into what I have to say. I do welcome the changes aimed at reducing the emissions of the hazardous substance from the industry. However, the proposed changes actually do little to protect the surrounding communities from dangerous, what I call unexpected emission incidences. incidents. The simplest and the cheapest and most effective way to reduce emissions is the use of proven, economically viable, state-of-the-art monitoring technologies, providing continuous measurements in real time for rapid identification of significant leaks and allowing for the treatment of those leaks. So continuous measurements in real time using open path FTAR analysis along lines, according to EPA method TO16, would provide a better answer than the currently proposed fence line canistering monitoring method. But due to their perceived high cost, I believe that EPA decided at this stage to remain with the, frequent, with the requirement for fence line monitoring at several points. And for some pollutants, including dangerous ethylene oxide, for less than 15% of the time. So this does not provide adequate protection for the health of the environment. So my suggestion is that the cost for continuous monitoring was not calculated correctly. It appears that the initial capital investment from industry was disproportionately factored in the technology assessment. A realistic comparison shows that despite the initial capital investment required to establish the monitoring system, by the second year of operation, the total expected investment to operate a continuous monitoring system is less than that required by sampling according to methods 325 and 317. And that after five years, the expected cost for sampling compared to monitoring is expected to be 300% higher. So I'll be submitting my comments in writing, but just a, a quick summary. Um, the initial investment for canisters only is $12,800. The sticker shock for the equivalent 2P open path FTARs is $500,000, which may seem like a, a large discrepancy. However, the annual cost for operating the canisters for the equivalent monitoring of two open path FTARs is almost $600,000, while the annual cost to monitor to operate the open path FTARs is $120,000. So by the time you reach year five, we're looking at an expense of an industrial site of $3 million for the equivalent monitoring or actually better monitoring with open path FTAR for approximately $1 million. So in reality, we can provide better monitoring at a lower cost with all the advantages of continuous monitoring according to EPA TO16, providing effective protection of the surrounding communities. So my request is to change the proposed measurement for monitoring the fence line to a continuous method based on measurement along lines such as EPA method CO16. And this change has several advantages. First of all, as I mentioned, it's cost effective. The overall cost is 70% less than the canister tube approach. One of the main advantages is that it identifies emissions in real time and it has a source location identification, identification capability. And this is the best way to stop emissions and to reduce overall emissions. Near real-time data combined with local wind data allows for the location of the emission source, facilitating fixing problems faster and allowing for root cause analysis based on EPA OTM principles. This technology has been proven with three years of operation in compliance with California's fence line monitoring rule. Real-time monitoring will enable public transparency. It allows a public website that reports real-time concentrations to the public, which is currently being done in California. Real-time analysis will allow for real-time alerting of the public by text messaging, emails, or public website, again, which is currently being done in California. 
It requires significantly less man hours in the field to identify and repair leaks, which means it's safer for the workers. And it also gives the ability to identify and fix problems quickly, helping to prevent catastrophic incidents, which can damage the health of the surrounding community and the environment of the surrounding community. So in conclusion, my suggestion is that the most effective approach is to use one official US EPA method and one state-of-the-art proven technology, Open Path FTAR, for monitoring compounds now and in the future. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to spell my name. It's Stephen with a V, S-T-E-V-E-N, Lazar, L-A, capital Z, A-R. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And I'm going to ask if the panelists have any questions for Mr. Lazar. Okay, thank you. Next, I'm going to um, turn turn back to Ms. Hillary Kaser. Um, if you would please begin. Thank, thank you. you so much. You can hear me now. Thank you so yes, much for fitting me you. in and, and working with me on the tech. I apologize. Uh, my name is Hillary with one L, H-I-L-A-R-Y. Last name is Kaxer. That is K as in Kilo, Alpha, Charlie, Sierra, Echo, Romeo, Kaxer. And I answer to anything. Um, I am a trained climate reality project leader, but I am not at all representing the climate reality project here today. Rather, I'm here simply as an individual member of the public and grateful to be able to testify at the US EPA virtual public hearing on the agency proposals on the United States synthetic organic chemical manufacturing industry and National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants, NESHAP, NESHAP, for the Synthetic Organic Chemical Manufacturing Industry and Group 1 and 2 Polymers and Resins Industry taking place today, May 16th, 2023. Your EPA update to these rules could eliminate illegal loopholes for 227 of the nation's riskiest chemical manufacturing facilities. National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants, NESHAP, protect public health and welfare by your setting air quality standards and regulating emissions of hazardous air pollutants. You at EPA wield a critically important tool in our country's effort to hold petrochemical and plastic manufacturers accountable using our federal laws. Companies like Dow, Monsanto, DuPont, and I don't even know how you say, Chimors, um, have polluted communities near those companies' plants and being exposed to the pollutants emitted by those petrochemical and plastic manufacturing plants significantly harms people living nearby the plants, people known as fence line communities. EPA must implement strong protections, not only for industry workers who are affected and implicated by these emissions and emissions and pollutants, but also for the communities living near the industrial polluters. Beyond the revisions that you have proposed, EPA should further improve several aspects of the rules, including fence line monitoring, increased flare efficiency and monitoring, enhanced leak detections and repair protocols, removal of the startups shutdown and malfunctions exemption, enhanced process controls, and much better monitoring of air pollution. Of these areas needing your improvement in the rules, the most egregious concern your at EPA's rule update must further address is leak detection and repair, LDAR. You and EPA commendably in your proposed new rules, do update leak standards specifically for sources that use ethylene oxide or chloroprene, and also for new and or modified facilities under the new source performance standards, NSPS. However, your and EPA's current version of the rule update fails to revise at all the leak standards for the vast majority of facilities. EPA yourself admit that the majority of emissions from HON and polymers and resins sources are fugitive. I'm just trying on my other screen because I can't see it here to monitor my time. Um, 
I wanted to put a little clarif. Oh, I got 30 seconds. Okay, forget that clarification. So um, it doesn't make sense, therefore, to leave in place outdated leak standards that EPA last updated well over a decade ago in 2006 for HON and 2008 for groups one and two polymers and resins. In addition, your analysis of developments in leak detection technologies and practices is, I have to say, faulty, as the agency did not consider leakless or low leak valves, optical gas imaging, or leak detection sensor networks. You also used flawed cost effectiveness this analysis using current day cost figures for new requirements, but still relying on 2007 cost figures for the savings and preventing losses of valuable chemicals. Therefore, please consider the proper range of leak detection technologies and apply revised standards for all facilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, panelists, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. All right. So um, again, um, for those who, you, who have joined, um, my name is Penny Lassiter. I'm the Director of Sector Policies and Programs Division here at EPA's Office of Air Quality um, Planning and Standards. And I have been chairing this um, session uh, of the public hearing. Um, at this time, there are no additional registered speakers for this session. I want to thank my fa fellow panelists and everyone who offered testimony today and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. Again, as a reminder, you can submit written comments on this proposal through June 26, 2023, Instructions for submitting written comments are available on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. At this time, we will take a recess. Our next session will begin at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you.
Welcome. Welcome to today's public hearing. My name is David Garcia. I am the director of the Air and Radiation Division in Region 6. I will be chairing this session of the virtual hearing. And thanks to, thanks to you all for attending today, for taking time out of your day to share your comments on EPA's proposal to update several rules applying to synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. This, pro this proposal, which EPA announced on April 6, 2023, would significantly reduce emissions of toxics and other harmful air pollutants from these plants, including the highly toxic chemical ethylene oxide and chloroprene. The proposal encompasses three national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants, or NESHAP. The hazardous organic NESHAP, also known as the HAN, the Group 1 Polymers and Resin NESHAP, and the Group 2 Polymers and Resins NESHAP. It also addresses four NS new source performance standards that apply to synthet synthetic organic chemicals and manufacturing. Now I'd like to ask our other EPA panelists to introduce themselves on the panel. Hi, I'm Michael Cantoni. I'm an engineer in the Sector Policies and Programs Division here at EPA. Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Robinson. I'm a branch manager in EPA Region 6, branch manager for air permitting, air monitoring, and air grants in Region 6. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jeff. We also are joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We all add the transcripts to the public docket for this rulemaking, and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. Now, before we begin hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to review to help make today's hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environmental, an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language, and images or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on the panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the, of the virtual hearing. We ask that everyone remain muted with their cameras off until it is your turn to speak. Okay, so let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will put the names of the next speaker in the chat box. We will also we also may use the chat box to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it is their turn. Let me apologize in advance if, for any mispronunciations. If you, are, if you are speaking today, please remove yourself in the Zoom participant list to match your registered speaker time. This will allow our logistics staff to quickly queue up the next speaker. For assistance, chat with attendee support. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you're joining us via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of the screen. If you're joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing the star six. Please state your first name and last name and spell it for the record. I'm gonna say that one more time. I'm gonna ask everybody to please state your, your first and last name and spell it for the record, please. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon left on your screen. It's on the left, bottom left of your screen. If you're not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give com comments. 
A four minute timer will be displayed on your screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it is time to stop. If you are te testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you would like to share, such as slide presentations or videos, you may submit them to the docket for the proposal through June the 26th of 2023. Instructions for submitting comments are, are on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. We encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post reminders about how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you are finished speaking, please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your phone, your phone line and turn off your camera. Actually, let me repeat that. Once we are done, please remute remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. If time allows, we may be able to attend, we may be able to add additional speakers. If you did not pre-register and are interested in speaking, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. Our logistics team will let you know if there are any time slots available and assist you with registration. For those of you watching the hearing on YouTube, you would like and you would like to speak, please email our registration support team. That email address is in this public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. Finally, today's hearing consists of three sessions. We've had the morning session, this is the afternoon session, and we also have an evening session. If there are no additional speakers, we may close a session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We may also take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time to share your comments on EPA's proposal. Now let's get started. Okay. Let me just get to my chat box here. Hmm. Okay. The first two speakers will be Naomi Yoder and Kathy Ferguson. So I'll kick this over to Naomi. Oh, thank you. My name is Naomi Yoder, N-A-O-M-I-Y-O-D-E-R. Um, I wanted to make a few comments. It might be kind of brief. Um, so, uh, but first I wanted to say something about um, uh, the fence line monitoring that will need to happen um, and that is already not happening. So, um, with the new rule, um, I would like to encourage the EPA to um, in, impose stricter limits for detection. Um, and because some of the pollutants have detection limits that are um, that don't indicate when those uh, pollutants are harmful. So, um, for example, ethylene oxide is one of those that needs much, much stricter, um, limits and um, 
we have seen this in several facilities that I work with communities um, that are impacted by those. Um, so, so ethylene oxide, it's, it is thought to, um, to be toxic at very low levels. Um, so the current uh, limit and the current proposed limit, I'm sorry, um, is, is not enough. Um, we need to have much more strict limits on ethylene oxide in particular um, for communities you know, that are already have been suffering with uh, under the pollution burden of ethylene oxide for, for many years now. Um, and I'm thinking of facilities in, in Southeast Texas or the Port Arthur Beaumont area. I'm thinking of um, facilities in Southwest Louisiana in the Lake Charles Westlake area. And I'm thinking of facilities um, in St. James and St. John Parish. Um, in Louisiana. So um, please make those, those restrictions much more um, strong. Um, and for other um, pollutants and toxins that we know that the science shows very clearly um, that there's uh, a health impact of, uh, of those, we need to have the most stringent uh, regulations possible uh, for emissions of those of those pollutants. Um, one other thing I'd like to comment on is the um, startup shutdown uh, malfunction guidelines. Um, so I approve, I support, <laughs> I, I applaud the EPA for removing those exemptions for, for SSM events. Um, there should be no exemptions. We should still have um, it, it's it's especially in the event of a, a startup shutdown or malfunction that we need some of the information of what's in you know being released into the air and water. So at Healthy Gulf, we uh, put together um, a, an analysis of a compilation of all of the pollution reports following Hurricane Ida in Southeast Louisiana and some offshore um, and. What we found out was that there was an extreme um, disproportionate under reporting of, uh, of those actual events. Um, it also took us um, two to three researchers. It took us about um, six months to compile this data that should be available to community members when the event is happening. So, you know, we need to know where there are oil spills, where there are um, air pollution releases during this, the after the immediate aftermath of the storm. So after- Schroeder, Hurricane, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but your time limit is up. Could you please wrap up? Sure, okay. Um, so at the in the aftermath of a storm, that's when facilities often release a huge amount of pollutants. Thank you. Okay, let me just ask if the panelists have any Questions, clarifying questions, Michael or Jeff? Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Yoder. Uh, next, I would uh, like to call Kathy Ferguson. Ms. Ferguson, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let me know when I'm ready. You, when I can go. you can go. All right, my name, my name is Kathy Ferguson. That's K-A-T-H-Y-F-E-R-G-U-S-O-N. I am an impacted person from the community of Institute West Virginia. And I'd like for you to just take one moment, panelists, to imagine your neighbor coming and knocking on your door and you receive them welcomingly and you, um, you know, introduce yourself and they introduce themselves and maybe, you know, they bring you a trinket um, by way of introduction and tell you about themselves that they'll be in their yard a lot. They'll be making some noise, but don't worry about it. They're working on something. You ask them what that is. And they tell you they're, you know, working on, I don't know, the same, they're, they're baking, they're baking the industry. Um, and they tell you that their stuff is really good, but don't worry about the smells and different things, you know, um, it only will cause a uh, little cancer as and you're like, huh? And they're like, yeah, just, it's just a small risk of cancer. And 
I feel like that's what we're living with here in Institute quite often. You know, we have communities all across the United States that have folks that move in to our communities unwittingly um, and set up camp and start producing things that, you know, you're told that are good for you, that are okay, um, that are innocuous, and only to find out maybe decades later, generations in the in, uh, case of Institute of West Virginia, that there are actually things that can kill you. And you look around your community and you realize that so many people have been devastated by, you know, poor health um, quality um, that succumbed to cancer and different things of that nature. And you can't help but to connect those dots. It's unfathomable to me that in 2023, we're just now starting to see an uptick in conversations around this, where um, in fact people have been dealing with this again for multiple generations. It's an absolute imperative that the EPA be the agency that it's charged to be, and that is for the protection, protection of human health and the environment. And in my assessment, the only acceptable cancer risk is for any community to be zero, and that is what the EPA should be striving towards. So I look around and I hear the many voices from folks from marginalized communities, uh, historically Black communities and brown communities all across the United States that have been put on um, things that are done without our permission, without our full knowledge, with limited knowledge, with limited access on how to push back. And so we do rely on the EPA to be um, step in the gap and, and help communities like ours out. Um, we're not asking for any handouts. We're just asking that people do their due diligence and take things seriously. Um, certainly, when we look at um, the technology where we are in the world, I mean, we can get, there's so many resources that are available. Um, you know, we're asking for monitoring, um, significant monitoring that's in real time that can be done on a daily basis, not, you know, reporting here or there on EPO and, and things of that nature. These are things that can happen right now. Um, there just has to be an investment towards that. And you all need to set the standards to make sure that those things happen. I've had conversations with um, different chemical companies in our community. They've mentioned things like leakless pipes. And I've asked, well, why don't we have that? And they say it's cost prohibitive. But for companies that are making multi-billions of dollars, it seems like a very meager investment um, to actually help support and sustain the health of the community. And not only for the community, but for their workers to make sure that they're not further at risk. So why not invest? Why not have those as part of the standard? Why not make sure that there, that there are valves that don't leak or that there are particular types of transitions and turnovers in infrastructure? You know, we have companies that have ground and infrastructure under the ground has been there for, again, decades upon decades. I can imagine the cracks and the crevices and things of that nature and things leaking out of that. And then we wonder why these things are happening. Ms. So, Ferguson, um, I appreciate the standards, but we definitely have to make sure that we use common technology, technology is available now to make sure that these things happen. Ms. Ferguson, um, can I please ask you to to close up? I, there's everybody we're keeping to a four minute rule. And so if you could please. Yeah, wait. I thought you gave me, is this my one minute warning, right? Uh, no, or four no? minutes just passed. If oh, I'm so sorry. Up. I apologize. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to say, okay. Anyway, but we need to make sure that this happens now and then this administration, while we have a committed president who says that he's interested in these things, let's make this happen. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Ferguson. And uh, panel, do you have any clarifying questions? Ms. Ferguson, thank you for your testimony. Um, next, I would like to ask uh, Stephanie Heron and Barbara Brandon is next after Stephanie. Stephanie? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful, thank you. My name is Stephanie Heron, uh, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-H-E-R-R-O-N. I am the national organizer with the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, or EJHA. EJHA is a national network of environmental and economic justice organizations that support a just transition to safer chemicals and a pollution-free economy that leaves no worker and no community behind. Our affiliates are located throughout the country and one thing they have in common is a deep love for their communities and their families, 
just about all of whom have and continue to be disproportionately harmed by toxic pollution. Over a dozen of the facilities covered by this rule are located in areas where EJHA has affiliates. For example, EJHA affiliate members in Mossville, Louisiana alone have seven Han facilities within a few miles of them, plus a number, as many more, at least seven more, that aren't covered under this source category, but are also contributing significant health harm. Mossville, like many of the communities where covered facilities are located, is a majority Black community. EPA's own analysis shows that the cancer risk from Han facilities and poly polymers and resins facilities are disproportionately located in communities that are Black or low income, and that after the rule as proposed is implemented, the remaining risk will still be disproportionately to people who are Black or low income. This is what we call environmental racism. The EJHA network is also aligned in a strategic partnership with the network Coming Clean. Together, we are guided by the vision of a safe and healthy environment outlined in the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals. And we recommend EPA look to that document and the accompanying papers for guidance in developing rules to achieve the agency's mission and to protect people. First off, EPA needs to move away from the paradigm of acceptable risk. The only acceptable risk of cancer and of other devastating health harms to communities is zero. That's what EPA should be striving toward in this and in every rulemaking. Further, communities don't experience the risk from toxic air pollution from one facility in a vacuum. In most of the communities impacted by one or more covered facility, it's not the only source of toxic air pollution. Our bodies don't have the option to only inhale or process one pollutant from one source at a time, and we need EPA to stop regulating air pollution like they do. Looking at cancer and other health risk in this siloed way downplays the real dangers to communities and workers inside these facilities. We strongly support the EPA's proposed rule, which is a big improvement over what's in place now, but it doesn't go far enough to protect our families. We strongly support EPA's decision to continue to rely on the best available science using the 2016 IRIS risk assessment to set emission standards. We're appreciative of the fact that you're taking actions in this rule and some other rules to try to address ethylene oxide and other hazardous air pollution that's contributing to astronomical cancer risks in communities to workers and fenceline communities. We're glad you're taking steps and really, really appreciate that this rule finally eliminates illegal and dangerous loopholes for periods of startup shutdown and malfunction because people can't just stop breathing when the plant has an incident. There are also a number of other positive improvements in this rule, but we believe that this rule can and must be strengthened in a number of ways, which I'm gonna summarize here and also submit a written comment. First, EPA must require the best available technology to prevent leaks and other fugitive emissions. EPA should require the Ms. most- Karen, can you please wrap up? Your four minutes is up, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't see it. Um, EPA should require uh, the most ad advanced leak detection and repair for all facilities, not just those emitting ETL and chloroprene. EPA should require fence line monitoring with corrective action at all facilities, releasing hazardous air pollution that can impact health. When action levels are exceeded, communities need to be notified in real time in multiple languages. And Thank finally, you. EPA must take swift action to strengthen protections in other source categories, including chemical Thank area you. manufacturing sources, polyether polyols. We appreciate it, Ms. Heron. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I'm sorry. Panelists, are you okay? Do y'all have any clarifying questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Heron. I appreciate it. Uh, Barbara Brandon, please. Barbara? I am. Hi yes. there. Hi. My name is Barbara Brandom, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-B-R-A-N-D-O-M. I'm speaking as a retired physician anesthesiologist in Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I participated in the care of many infants, children, and adolescents with leukemia or solid cancers 
It was my work to keep them alive during surgery and as comfortable as possible afterward. I saw every day that it's better to prevent these illnesses than to have to treat them. In early 2022, President Biden announced resumed federal support for steps that aim to reduce the number of deaths from cancer by half in the coming 25 years. Reducing exposure, exposure to carcinogenic chemicals will be a very important method to reduce human, human suffering and death from cancer. Chronic long-term exposure to ethylene oxide increases the risk of lymphoid cancer in humans and breast cancer in females. So therefore, the proposed rules are very important for reducing risks from ethylene oxide. Open flame stack flaring should be eliminated. The proposed enhanced monitoring of flares is a significant improvement, but it's not adequate to detect smoking flares. All flaring produces significant pollution with negative health results. Smoking flares should not be given exceptions. Uh, um, the experts say predicting when a flare will smoke is more art than science at this point. Therefore, protection of public health requires decreasing stack emissions that can flare. It is important to require fence line monitoring. As the previous speaker mentioned, all facilities should be required to have fence line monitoring. However, the detection limits for some pollutions are much too high. For example, ethylene oxide is toxic at 11 parts per trillion in ambient air. Ethylene oxide is a recognized carcinogen, and as we said, the EPA is using a 300 parts per trillion detection limit and 900 parts per trillion as a fence line action limit. This is certainly an adequate order of magnitude. Updated leak standards are proposed for new facilities, but the same standard should apply to all facilities that use ethylene oxide. Outdated leak standards from 2006 and 2008 should be removed. New technologies, including leakless or low leak valves, optical gas imaging, and leak detection sensor networks should be encouraged so that a uh, concentration of ethylene oxide in order of magnitude lower than the current detection limit can be, uh, can be found and documented. And I agree, it's good that exemptions for air pollution during startup shutdown and malfunctions are removed. Do not allow new exemptions to be inserted prior to finalization of these rules. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I look forward to improvement in air quality. We really need it everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brandon. Panelists, do you all have any clarifying questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, I would like to call Claire Richards, and after Claire Richards, it's going to be John Sonnen. Ms. Hello, Richard, can you hear me? There? Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, thank you to, oh, sorry, uh, thank you for having us here to take comments. Um, I am here to express support for the proposed rules. I'm a nursing professor, and um, my interest is in protecting uh, human health from the cancerous effects of ethylene oxide. Um, many other nurses and physicians that I work with have had the types of cancers people have mentioned here that are associated with ethylene oxide. Um, ours is a profession that is exposed to ethylene oxide from sterilizing equipment in the medical setting. And I know the rule isn't applying to that particular exposure. Um, I also had a colleague who died suddenly of pancreatic cancer this last year. Uh, she had uh, previously worked in cosmetology, a profession that is exposed to ethylene oxide as well as other um, exposures. Although we'll never know for sure if ethylene oxide is the cause of these specific cases, um, and the proposed here ruling here doesn't address those exposure types. Um, people don't often expect that they'll be exposed to hazardous chemicals when they go to work and especially not at home. And so I share that to say, you know, it's very important to protect people in people's lives in their daily, daily life at home. Um, I agree with some of the other folks who have testified that acceptable risk should be questioned. Um, most uh, people who are exposed to the pollutants are people of color or people with low incomes and people who have limited English proficiency. So I would like to encourage you to 
consider strengthening the ethylene, um, the rules on um, ethylene oxide emissions and to expand the rule to include offsite warehouses where newly sterilized equipment is often stored and continues to off-gas ethylene oxide. Many people are unaware about um, off-gassing generally and don't consider those risks. Um, and it is, it is really important to also require fence line monitoring to, to um, have that knowledge of what the ambient ethylene oxide concentrations are. And so please also uh, close all the loopholes and require facilities um, to comply with the rules sooner than the 18 month timeline. So thank you for having me today and listening. Ms. Richards, could you please, for the for the record, could you please spell your first and last name? Yeah, it's a C-L-A-I-R-E, last name Richards, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Jeff, you have any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Richards. Next, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring John Sonnen to the microphone. Thank you, folks. My name is John Sonnen, S like J O H N S O N I N. Thank you. And I originate from Douglas, Alaska. And uh, thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly without my having to tell you. Um, <laughs> To begin, to begin with, um, a previous speaker uh, talked about talked about the particulates and the level of particulates. Uh, any they should they should be uh, um, uh, controlled from the source completely. Uh, we cannot allow um, toxic uh, and cancer causing and then. Uh, just uh, anything non-organic, and that's in, it's pretty funny in, in the title of this uh, rule. You would call it uh, synthetic organic. It's almost oxymoronic because um, I mean I can see how it would work. It's a synthesis of organic and um, elements, but synthetic and organic are at odds with each other. Any element that is not organic that is introduced into the into the thesis of this planet, the, the uh, system, the, altogether the thesis, has an effect on uh, other um, elements in, in the system to the extent of uh, its, its uh, relevance, I guess. Um, and it only it only uh, dissipate as it separate or as it disperses through the system, but it'll start off initially with the the strongest impact. Something like in Cancer Alley, in Louisiana, and Texas, all of that stuff is is uh, just preposterously destructive. And you know, uh, I grew up near O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and my argument with them to control that from expansion was that why is not everybody who enjoys the benefits of air travel having to suffer the consequences of not only the noise, which was the issue when I was a child, but the I find, later found out the synthetic crap coming out from the emissions is it's just destroying. I mean, I'm sure it's impacted me to this point. I mean, this is like 60 or 50 years later. Um, nonetheless, Cancer Alley, and uh, it, it's like the impact of un or inorganic material on organic material dissipates the further it gets from the source. But uh, that initial uh, impact is is disastrous. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, the the woman I'm thinking of was Ferguson, I think, and it's like shooting the guns. Uh, willy nilly, uh, everywhere. Uh, I'm thinking about Ferguson, uh, Missouri, and uh, the one guy who laid there in the street. That's what happens. If you, now you think about the synthetic uh, destruction of uh, organic things, that's how the impact is. And I am grateful that EPA has taken this step. 
but I want them to go further uh, and to the point where no inorganic material is allowed to affect organic things. Thank you, Mr. Snow. And is, could you please wrap up? Or did sure, you? Just... I think, uh, oh, I thought I, I thought I had. That's, okay, just make it that's sure. Good enough. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. And um, panelists, do y'all have any clarifying questions? Okay, well, Thanks, thank you, you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> next, I, next, I would like to call uh, Tammy Murphy. And after Tammy Murphy, it'd be Kathleen Riley. Ms. Murphy? Hi. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Tammy Murphy. I'm with Physicians for Social Responsibility in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, so the proposed rule is a major step in the right direction, yet it still falls short of the Biden administration commitments to um, environmental justice communities. And it also falls short of the requirement under the Clean Air Act to protect human health from toxic air emissions. Um, presuming that the rule is adopted without any uh, weakening changes, um, it would still continue to perpetuate environmental racism by leaving more than 1.6 black and brown residents, um, representing 64% of the impacted community facing serious cancer risk. It would only reduce the number of people facing serious cancer risk by 21% and those facing significant cancer risk by 75%, leaving 25% to still face significant cancer risk, contrary to the EPA policy to strive to eliminate such risks. Uh, it would also fail to limit future increases in toxic air emissions due to petrochemical plastics, which drive most chemical manufacturing without production projected to double in the next decade. It also fails to um, sufficiently reduce toxic fugitive emissions by not requiring all available control technologies. For example, optimal gas imaging cameras, leakless equipment, infrared monitoring, and automated leak detection. In its final rule, EPA should require chemical manufacturers to deploy all available technologies to further reduce emissions of hazardous air pollutants, especially of ethylene oxide. The EPA itself acknowledges that several technologies are used by other industries that could and should be required explicitly in this rule to further reduce hazardous air emissions, especially of ethylene oxide from leaking equipment, including the following, uses of leakless, uh, low emitting equipment for valves and pumps, use of optimal gas imaging cameras, use of thermal red infrared cameras or thermal infrared cameras. And to find, that is to find larger uh, leaks faster. And also the, the use of leak detention, leak detection sensor networks that could potentially identify leaks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, if you didn't earlier, did, could you please spell your first and last name? Sure, Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y. Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y. Thank you. Panelists, any questions, clarifying? All right, Ms. Murphy, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, I would like to call Kathleen Riley. Ms. Riley? Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Kathleen Riley. That's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N and R-I-L-E-Y. I'm an attorney with Earth Justice, a nonprofit legal organization dedicated to protecting people's right to a healthy environment. Earth Justice has been working for years with fenceline communities to push EPA to address the health harms from chemical facilities air pollution, including from the carcinogen ethylene oxide. Even one case of cancer from these facilities air pollution is too many. With Earth Justice, I work with many people who have to breathe these facilities pollution and who get sick as a result. I'm also from Geismar, Louisiana, where at least 10 of the dangerous and cancer-causing chemical plants regulated by, regulated by this rule are located. That's 10 major chemical plants in a three mile radius, just regulated by this rule, including the Shell facility that emits ethylene oxide and increases cancer risk by 501 million, and the BASF facility that increases cancer risk by another 201 million. Before I lived in Geismar, my family lived in Destrehan, Louisiana, just a few miles from Union Carbide in Hanville. This facility also emits ethylene oxide and increases cancer risk by 701 million. In fact, of the 
24 Han facilities that emit ethylene oxide, nine are in Louisiana and 13 in Texas. And after much of a lifetime living near these pollution sources, my mom has had two cancer scares in the last less than two years. So for my own family and for the many families living near chemical plant pollution, I'm glad that EPA has proposed improvements to this rule, including requiring fence line monitoring for some facilities with corrective action and in, uh, proposed improved leak detection and repair for facilities that use ethylene oxide and chloroprene. But EPA must extend these improvements to all these facilities to better protect public health. EPA must also require more frequent reporting of fence line monitoring data and a shorter compliance period. A rolling annual average isn't enough to protect families living near these plants. I'm also glad that EPA reconsidered risks from these facilities. EPA missed the huge risks from these facilities in its prior rule in 2006, before we knew how dangerous ethylene oxide was, for example. This is exactly why the Clean Air Act requires EPA to reconsider risk, whether to leave communities exposed to high risks of cancer and other health risks, it's not up to EPA's discretion. And EPA rightly recognized the risks to families living near these facilities is unacceptable. EPA estimates that its proposed improvements will reduce cancer risk for 87,000 people from uh, cancer risk from these facilities to below 101 million. But as others have said, this benchmark is too high, especially when people are exposed to many sources of air pollution. EPA must consider and further reduce risk in the places, especially in the places where chemical plants are most concentrated. In Geismar, for example, Geismar, Louisiana, the post-control cancer risk from the 10 Han and TNR facilities still adds up to over 151 million. Similarly, in Plaquemine, Louisiana, Fort Natchez, Texas, and Pasadena, Texas, just to name a few, the post-control cancer risks from the facilities covered by this rule add up. And people have to breathe pollution from many other types of facilities not covered by this proposal. So EPA must do more to reduce combined risk in the cities and towns where chemical plants are most concentrated. Uh, thank you for your time today and for your continued work towards a strong rule to protect families living near chemical plants, including my family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley, for your testimony. Panelists, any questions? Thank you very much. Next, I would like to call Allison Cade and Dora Williams. After Allison, please. Ms. Cade. Ms. Cade, are you there? It's possible that you're you're there, but maybe you're on mute. Uh, David, I don't see Allison's name in the list anymore, so maybe she had to um, okay re remove. But we can uh, reconnect uh, with her here shortly if we want to move okay. ahead with uh, Dora. Uh, Miss Williams, are you there, Dora Williams? Yes. Yes. I'm oh, here. great. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Miss Williams, you please go ahead if you start by spelling your first and last name. Okay. My first name is Dora, D O R A. My last name is Williams, W I L L I A M S. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it says um, start my video. I'm not sure. No. Oh, I'm um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. There you are. We I'm see you. <laughs> I'm a little nervous here. Okay. Is should I start now? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the EPA um, Environmental Protection Agency um today. Um we are we we thank you for the rulemaking that you are um, proposing for the fence line monitoring. Um, however, uh, I am from Newcastle, Delaware, in the home of the Crota Atlas ethylene oxide plant. And because we are a source category, we will not be, um, the, the Crota plant is not um, counted in that um, rule. However, we believe that um, if no source of, of, of um, pollution that's going to cause cancer or health risk is, is acceptable. So we're hoping that 
soon you will look across the board and see that monitoring is needed wherever this source is. And thank you very much for having us today. We appreciate your, your um, time. Thank you. Ms. Williams, you may have been nervous, but you did a great job. Thank you for oh. your testimony. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank any you. clarifying questions? Okay. Next, I would like to call uh, Kyle Farrer and Rachel Myers. Kyle, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Just give me one second. Sorry, you caught me in transit. <clears throat> All right. All right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. My, my name is Kyle Farrar. That's K-Y-L-E. F-E-R-R-A-R, -R -R, no problem at all. Sorry. Fair. Not at all. So, um, yeah, I, I've been working in the field of risk assessment and exposure assessment uh, with a focus on environmental equity for the past 15 years. Um, I am the Western Program Coordinator at a nonprofit called Frack Tracker Alliance. We are a, a nonprofit focused on data transparency and environmental justice. Uh, in the petrochemical and hydrocarbon extraction uh, uh, industry. And uh, uh, we have been, uh, we are a, a national nonprofit that also works internationally with a number of groups. So uh, we will be submitting uh, written comments as well, along with these verbal comments. Um, and uh, the, the analysis that we'll be submitting showed that the eight chemical plants that, we, that would be most affected uh, by these proposed rules are located in regions of Louisiana and Texas, disproportionately impacted by chemical manufacturing and other sources of air pollution, including petroleum refineries. Uh, additionally, our written comments show that the most impacted communities are also marginalized communities and disproportionately low income and communities of color, uh, which supports the EPA's own findings. These are not new results, um, but we add maps and uh, just some more information, really looking at inter intersectionalities of disparity. Um, how's my uh, sound coming through? You can hear me? Oh, what? Yes. All right. Yes. Great. So uh, the analysis shows that the census tracts with chemical manufacturing plants that would be addressed by this rule are in the 90th percentile, percentile for aggregated toxicity weighted concentrations of emissions as identified by risk screening environmental indicators. Um, and uh, also highlights a, a number of other, um, a number of, of other very high percentiles for uh, uh, emissions of uh, HAPs and VOCs. Uh, the track tracker analysis um, maps of impacted communities results showing the elevated risk will be provided, like I said, in the, in the written comments. So as for the verbal comments, our organization wants to stress that the proposed EPA rules are just a starting point for what is really necessary to relieve some of the negative health burden for these communities. The fact that this rule is the first to require fence line monitors for benzene and chloride compounds is really an absolute embarrassment uh, to both federal and state agencies, but that's the reality of uh, uh, where our regulations are on HAP specifically. So as such, the proposed rule of the common sense regulation. For the first time, operators will be required to conduct ambient monitoring for L uh, and LDAR and actually require the facilities to fix leaks when they find them. Uh, the requirement for transparency and publishing monitoring results is another uh, uh, basic privilege for these communities that uh, has been lacking. So uh, when it comes to publishing the data, uh, we would stress that a uh, real-time monitoring is necessary um, at the fence line and within the facility, and that the data be published uh, in real-time results um, that can be tracked. The importance there is seeing spikes in VOCs uh, in HAP and not just eight-hour averages or six-hour averages. Um, and unfortunately, uh, regulations are written you know, in a way that eight-hour averages are uh, what is being considered. But as we know, those regulations are based on occupational exposures um, and pretty much blood tests, right? Um, not actually, not exposures to communities um, living around these facilities. So we really need to update our perspective on how exposures are occurring and realize that these uh, spikes and plumes that are being released uh, from leaks and other uh, uncontrolled emission sources are main risk drivers for cancer. Uh, 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 cumulative chronic uh, peak exposure, uh, as well as um, uh, neurotoxins and other health impacts. So in conclusion, Frack Tracker Alliance is voicing support for the version of this rule most protective of public health. As this rule still falls short of requiring the implementation of MAC or BAC standards to reduce emissions and the use of state-of-the-art LDAR equipment oh. that can identify leaks 
Thank you, Kyle. Imaging. So we also support the demands of modesty and Air Force. Thank so, you. Thank you Any so much. Claire and fine questions from the panel? Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Um, at this point, uh, how about Rachel Meyer? Rachel, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hello. My name is Rachel Meyer, R-A-C-H-E-L, -M Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. And I'm the Ohio River Valley Field Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, an organization with over 1.5 million members working to protect children from air pollution and climate change. I am from Independence Township, Beaver County in Pennsylvania. I support the proposal to strengthen standards for synthetic organic chemical plants and polymers and resins plants and urge the EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to protect the health of families living nearby. Petrochemical manufacturing is one of the heaviest polluting industrial sectors in the country. My family's home is located near petrochemical facilities. And we have experienced multiple high pollution events during times of startup, shutdown, and malfunctions. The cumulative impacts of tox toxic pollution releases during SSM events can increase the risk of cancer as well as respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological, and reproductive problems for the people living nearby. Families living near petrochemical facilities should be protected from harmful pollution at all times, as promised in the Clean Air Act. I strongly support the removal of pollution exemptions during SSM, and I urge the EPA to keep any new versions of SSM exemptions out of these rules before they are finalized. As community members, we often are not told what is being emitted from a facility, even when we can smell chemicals in the air. People in our community are scared about how the pollution is affecting their children. Children are especially vulnerable to pollution from these facilities because their bodies are still developing and because they breathe in more air relative to their size than adults. Breathing in more air can mean breathing in more pollution. Science has found an association of air toxics, such as benzene and 3 butadine and increased rates of childhood leukemia. These same air toxics are commonly emitted by petrochemical facilities. Knowing how harmful air toxics are to health, uh, but not knowing what is actually being emitted by local plants is a serious source of anxiety for me and far too many parents. The requirement for fence line monitoring of six pollutants will improve transparency for communities living with these facilities that have a history of repeated violations as well. The latest, most advanced fence line monitoring technology must be required at every facility covered by these rules. Also, the current action level should be lowered to be more health protective. Flaring is another huge concern um, for communities like mine living near petrochemical facilities. We dread seeing the flames rise up, often accompanied by plumes of dark smoke. The rule requiring increased combustion efficiency is an additional needed safeguard for people's health, but there needs to be a phase out of open flame stack flares as, addition, as an additional requirement. There must also be higher standards for leak detection and repair. The most advanced technologies should be required, including optical gas imaging, and these standards should apply for all facilities. I want to commend the EPA for the inclusion of the community risk assessment. It is so important to take into consideration toxic emissions of nearby polluters. I hope to see this data factored into future rulemaking and look forward to seeing how it will further improve conditions for communities. The proposed rules are so very needed for the protection of people in our communities. They are an exciting step forward. And with the addition of some very important and reasonable strengthening requirements, they can have the greatest positive impact. I thank the EPA for these rules and call on them to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities that are harming people's health and heating the climate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Um, panelists, is, do you have any clarified questions? Okay, Ms. Myers, thank you for your testimony. Next, let's see, we have next. Yes, the next two speakers will be, oh boy, uh, Mijo Liguera and Julie Pelluer. I know, I'm sorry up front, I butchered those names. Yeah, it was close. 
Hi, my name is Miho Laguerre. It's spelled M-I-H-O. So you got my first name right. Laguerre, L-I-G-A-R-E. And I'm the Plastic Pollution Policy Manager with the Surfrider Foundation. The Surfrider Foundation is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean waves and beaches for all people through a powerful activist network. We appreciate the EPA's work, and while this is a major step in the right direction, there's more that needs to be done to protect communities and the environment, especially those in the frontline and fence line. Frontline and fence line communities suffer the first and worst impacts of the petrochemical industry's toxic pollution. The fossil fuel industry is using single-use plastics to justify operating business as usual and even expanding, despite these products being unnecessary and exacerbating climate change impacts. Plastic production, production has soared during the 20th century from 2 million metric tons in 1950 to 348 million metric tons in 2017 and is expected to double in capacity yet again by 2040. That means that related chemical production and its associated air emissions are also likely to double within 10 to 15 years. In developing these proposed rule, EPA fails to consider trends in plastic production and the likelihood that the hazardous air emission it proposes to partially control will significantly increase in the near future. We recommend that the EPA take action to curb plastic-related chemical production and associated emissions of hazardous air pollutants. Furthermore, EPA should assess future emissions of hazardous air pollutants based on industry's projected growth rates in plastics and chemical manufacturing. To offset these projected increases, increases, EPA should impose caps on chemical production and total emissions of hazardous air pollutants. Finally, we, ur we urge that the EPA require fence line monitoring at all facilities at adequate detection levels, which have been brought up many times during this hearing. Every facility covered by these source categories should have fence line monitors to ensure the safety of communities. And so thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. Uh, Jeff, Michael, any clarifying questions? Thank you for your testimony again. Uh, next, I'd like to call Julie Peller. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Julie Peller, J-U-L-I-E-P-E-L-L-E-R. And I speak today as a PhD environmental chemist. I've been teaching and researching for three decades about chemical pollutants in the air, water, and soil. Over the past decade, I have worked with environmental justice communities and have witnessed many of the effects of higher pollution exposures to these vulnerable communities. While science continues to advance our understanding of pollution types and loads, and these can now be more effectively monitored and understood, the regulations and laws that are required to protect human and environmental health in many ways have not been adequately updated. This EPA proposal to update emission standards for hazardous air pollutants, specifically uh, to strengthen standards for synthetic organic chemical plants and group one and two polymers and resins plants is a necessary move forward, especially for the environmental justice communities that have taken on too much of the burden of industrial hazardous air pollutants. Ethylene oxide and chloroprene are known hazardous compounds that are emitted in certain manufacturing plants. A 2018 EPA study concluded that areas around all these facilities had higher risks of cancer, up to 24 times higher than areas not polluted by this harmful compound. These facilities have become larger over the years and laws ensuring that the manufacturing is safe for those living near the plants are absolutely critical. The proposed rules are expected to protect over 2 million people from harmful fumes, um, and it's projected to cut pollution of volatile organic compounds by 23,500 tons per year. It's clear that these updates will save lives and increase the quality of life for so many, in addition to the num numerous protections for the environment. Uh, other crucial aspects of this proposal include the monitoring of these and other hazardous chemicals and accountability when the con concentrations are above the action level. Uh, this proposal states that, quote, owners and operators would have to find the cause and correct it, end of quote. Uh, laws and regulations must be enforced to be of value. Uh, further, there will be new limits for dioxins and furans, other very um, hazardous uh, compounds. 
There was a time when industrial processes were limited in their ability to reduce emissions, but that time has passed. We have the technology and it's imperative that the EPA work on behalf of the environment and behalf of human health to reduce harm by large, highly profitable industries. Communities near these facilities have suffered far too long and it's time for stronger standards and accountability. I live near EJ communities exposed to excess pollution in part a consequence of weak penalties, seemingly slow or absent enforcement, and outdated regulations. This proposal is inc an incredibly important part of improving the problems associated with toxic emissions. I'm grateful for those working at the EPA who have studied these scenarios and formulated necessary updates. Uh, I fully support this proposal to strengthen standards for the synthetic organic chemical plants in group one and two polymers and residence plants. Thank you very much for letting me uh, speak today. Thank you, Ms. Peller. Uh, panelists, is there any clarifying questions that y'all may have? Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, again, my name is David Garcia. I've been chairing the he hearing this hearing session. I wanna thank everyone who has shared their comments so far today on EPA's proposed action. If you have questions about today's hearing, or are interested in to speak, um, please register. Uh, if you'd like to, if you're interested in re registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing the star nine and our logistics teams will reach out to you to let you know if there are any time slots available. If you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email your registration support team. That email address in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. At this time, we're going to take a short recess. We'll resume the hearing at the time shown in the slides. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back from the break. Again, my name is David Garcia. I'm the Air and Radiation Division Director in Region 6 office in Dallas, Texas. I am chairing this session of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions on toxics and other harmful air pollutants from plants and make synthetic organic chemicals in plants that make certain polymers and resins. Joining me on the panelists are Jeff or Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Cantoni. I'm a member of the Sector Policies and Programs Division here at EPA. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Robinson. I'm a branch manager in EPA Region 6 for air permitting, air monitoring, and air grants. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jeff. I want to remind you that today's hearing is being recorded and transcribed to produce a written transcript of the hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll, be, we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. For those of you on Zoom, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us via the phone, you can raise your hands by pressing star nine. Our logistics, teams will, our logistics team will add you to today's agenda if there are any slots available. If you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our, our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa. Dot gov forward slash eto forward slash hon. Please note by registering for this event, you are agree, agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. That includes rules of behavior. EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing event meeting. EPA expects all part participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. A quick reminder, about providing testimony. When I call you to speak, please unmute your line. While you're providing testimony, you also are welcome to activate your camera by clicking on the start video icon. Please state and spell your name for the record. A four minute timer will start when, you're, when you state your name. Let's see if we have any speakers at this point. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our next two speakers are Tanisha Harris and Steve Stephen Fate. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Tanisha, are you there? Hello. Yes, I am, and you did pronounce it correctly. Great, thank you. Could you please uh, repeat your name and spell it for our records? Tanisha Harris, T-O-N. Y I S H A Harris H A R R I S. Thank you. Ms. Harris, feel free to um, start your testimony. Okay. Hello, my name is Tanisha Harris. I am 25, I am a 25 year old youth climate and environmental justice activist and the Associate Director of Communications and Partnerships for Action for the Climate Emergency. I thank the EPA for opening this hearing to the public and urge you to take strong action and enact the strictest possible regulations for petrochemical facilities. Cancer Alley comes to mind when thinking about petrochemical facilities. I was appalled when I learned about Cancer Alley, an 85 mile stretch of land with over 200 petrochemical plants and oil refineries in Louisiana. 85 miles, 
85 rates of cancer in Louisiana, according to Tulane University. Why does this particular area, this predominantly Black area, have such high rates of cancer? Because the petrochemical facilities are allowed to pollute their environment, their communities, and harm them. This got me thinking, what about the petrochemical plants in my home state of Illinois? Plants like DuPont are located in environmental justice communities that are already suffered disproportionate effects of pollution that threaten the health and well-being. Lake County, Illinois has an elevated risk of cancer due to ethylene oxide from nearby petrochemical facilities like Medline or Vantage Specialties. The EPA has the authority and obligation to protect these communities by enacting the strictest possible regulations on these cancer-causing facilities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Jeff uh, or Michael, do you have any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Harris. Next, I'd like to call Stephen Feit. Feit. Hi, Good Steve. afternoon. My name is Stephen Feit. Um, that's S T E V E N F E I T. Thank you. Good to go. Awesome. Thanks again. Uh, thank you for providing the opportunity uh, for me to speak to you today. I'm a senior attorney and legal and research manager at the Center for International Environmental Law, or CL. Since 1989, CL has used the power of law to protect the environment, promote human rights, and ensure a just and sustainable society. I'm here today to both commend the EPA for its proposed rule and to implore you to go further. The need for environmental protection and pollution control from the petrochemical industry is great, and the need is slated to grow significantly in the coming years. Moreover, as the international community confronts the scourge of plastic pollution, the United States must not fall behind global ambition. As the world transitions away from using fossil fuels for energy and transportation, the industry is looking to petrochemicals as a source of growth and profit. And we've already seen a massive expansion in production capacity over the past decade, with many more projects in the planning or development stages. These facilities are enormous sources of pollution, increasingly larger in scope and in scale. If this anticipated growth in capacity comes to pass, it will bring with it a concomitant increase in air pollution. And as we know and have heard, these facilities cluster and many new facilities will add to the cumulative pollution load that already plagues areas of significant petrochemical production, particularly in the Gulf South. This problem is so severe that two years ago, human rights experts appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council raised serious concerns about the continued development of petrochemical complexes in Louisiana's Cancer Alley, describing the situation as a form of environmental racism. Though EPA has recently considered the issue of cumulative impacts, it remains a critical and unsolved issue. And against this backdrop of petrochemical expansion and the already catastrophic plastic pollution crisis that it will further foment, communities across the world are pushing back. Delegates are meeting in less than two weeks to continue negotiations on a legally binding international plastics treaty covering the entire life cycle of plastic, including its production. Global standards for petrochemicals production are likely to be a critical part of this treaty, and this rulemaking is an opportunity for the United States to meet the moment and set its ambition high. So in the context of this rule, there are a number of elements that could be strengthened. In particular, EPA should require leakless valves, optical gas imaging, and leak detection sensor networks. It should require the phase out of open flame stack flares, expand and improve fence line monitoring, impose caps on toxic emissions, and increase the stringency of emission standards to achieve maximum protection for the public. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Jeff, Michael, any clarifying questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, next, I'd like to call Graham Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, are you there? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, I am. Right. My name is Graham Hamilton. That's G-R-A-H-A-M-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N. I wanna thank you all for hosting this hearing and the opportunity to provide public comment. Um, I serve as the US policy officer for Break Free From Plastic. Break Free is a global movement working to achieve a future free from plastic pollution 
And we're represented by over 12,000 individuals and organizations around the world confronting pollution at every point of the deadly life cycle of plastics. And we're here to support the EPA finally taking action to strengthen rules regulating the chemical manufacturing sector. And while there are significant protections proposed in these new rules, there appear to be several key missed opportunities, which my colleague Stephen uh, illuminated a moment ago. I really appreciate the new community-focused risk analysis that were conducted for these rules, but it's, it's worth noting that the connective tissue between the risk analysis and emission reduction measures must be strengthened. I mean, it's, it raises the question of like, what good is your community risk analysis if you're not ultimately linking your findings directly to the regulatory requirements of the rule? And with regard to leak detection and repair, I'm wondering why the agency isn't considering leakless valves or optical gas imaging or leak detection sensor networks if the agency knows that the majority of emissions from Han and polymer and resin sources are fugitive, why aren't you requiring an appropriate range of leak detection technologies and applying the revised standards to all facilities? With flaring, the enhanced monitoring requirements for flares are admittedly a vast improvement over current standards, but the agency should be pursuing the phase out of open flame stack flares instead of proposing to give smoking flares a pass every three years when operating above quote unquote smokeless capacity. And with regard to fence line monitoring, EPA should be mandating that every facility covered by these source categories are equipped with advanced monitoring technologies to ensure that detection limits and action levels at the fence line are as low as possible. And lastly, with regard to startup shutdown and malfunction, the decision to remove these exemptions created in previous rules for SSM is welcome and should really be set in stone. The agency must not use this rulemaking period as an opportunity to insert new versions of SSM into the rules before they're finalized. And on a personal note, as a surfer who grew up, grew up in the Pacific Northwest, my, my awareness of the plastic pollution crisis was born at sea far away from the petrochemical sacrifice zones where plastic is produced by multinational corporations that for far too long have been given license by state and federal agencies to poison low wealth, black and brown and indigenous communities. These new rules are a step in the right direction, but we need them to go further if we all want to have any hope of addressing intergenerational harms and the environmental racism and injustices that continue to plague communities across the country. With these rules, we implore the EPA to prioritize the concerns of impacted communities living on the front lines of toxic petrochemical pollution over the interest of serial polluters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Jeff, Michael, any clarifying questions? Again, thank you, Mr. Hamilton, for your testimony. Again, my name is David Garcia. I've been uh, chairing this hearing session. I want to thank everyone who has start, who has shared their comments so far on EPA's proposed action. If you have any questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing the star nine and our list logistics teams will reach out to you to let you know if there is any time slots available. If you are watching the hear, if you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our registration support team. That email address is the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash E T O forward slash H O N. At this time, we're going to take a short recess. We'll resume the hearing at the time that you'll see on the slide. So thank you very much. We're going to take a short recess.
Hello and welcome back. Uh, welcome back from the break. My name again is David Garcia. I am the Air and Radiation Division Director at EPA's Region 6 office in Dallas, Texas. I am chairing this session of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxics and other harmful air pollution from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. <clears throat> Joining me on the panel are Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Cantoni. I'm an engineer in the Sector Policies and Programs Division here at the EPA. And Jeff. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Robinson. I'm a branch manager for air permitting, air monitoring, and air grants in EPA Region 6. Thank you, Michael, and th thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I want to remind you that today's hearing is being recorded and transcribed to produce a written transcript of the hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for the uh, rulemaking, and we will and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. For those of you on Zoom, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us via the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Our logistics team will add you to today's agenda if there are any time slots available. If you are watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our registration support team. This email address is the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. Please note by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. That includes rules of behavior. <clears throat> EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing event or meeting. EPA expects all participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure the common standards of decency are upheld. A quick reminder about providing testimony. When I call you to speak, please unmute your line. While you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your camera by clicking the start video icon. Please state and spell your name for the record. A four minute timer will be started when you state your name. Let's see if we have any speakers here. Let's see, how about Lizzie Duncan? Lizzie, would you like to um, share your testimony? Yes, thank you so much. You betcha. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lizzie Duncan, L-I-Z-Z-Y, -Z -Z last name Duncan, D-U-N-C-A-N, and I am with the League of Conservation Voters. LCV works to advance equitable policy solutions that ensure clean air, clean water, and access to our democracy are not a privilege, but a right afforded to every community. Thank you for providing me the time to speak today. Um, I'm here to urge the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards for synthetic organic chemical, chemical plants. The proposed rule would ensure that facilities using, producing, storing, or emitting six different types of highly toxic chemicals would have to monitor these chemicals around their perimeter and make the data publicly available. Cutting ethylene oxide emissions and chlor chlor chloroprene alone um, would result in drastic emissions reductions overall. Exposure to ethylene oxide alone can cause cancer, damage to the nervous system, and reproductive harm. Um, toxic air pollution is has detrimental health outcomes for people across the country, specifically low wealth communities, communities of color, and those living in proximity to the over 200 synthetic organic chemical plants in the U.S. The proposed rule would reduce over 6,000 tons of hazardous air pollution across critical sites like Texas's Gulf Coast, Cancer Alley in Louisiana, West Virginia's Chemical Alley, as well as concentrated locations in Ohio, Kentucky, Alabama, and Illinois. Breathing clean air is a basic human right. 
Our families and communities should be able to trust that the air they are breathing is clean and not going to cause significant health risks to themselves, their families, or their children. I'm urging EPA to do its duty of protecting the environment and safeguarding our health. Please move to swiftly finalize the strongest standards for reducing air pollution from these plants. Doing so would be an invaluable win for environmental justice communities um, across the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, Michael or Jeff, do you have any clarifying questions? Thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, there, there's um, no additional registered speakers at this time. We're going to take another 15 minute break while we wait for more speakers. Um, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and our logistics team will reach out to you. At this time, we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll reconvene at 331, I believe. Thank you very much.
Okay. All right. Well, I sure want to thank everybody who's stayed with us and been patient. Um, believe it or not, we do not have any additional speakers at this time. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this session out. So I, I'm just going to mention again, again, my name is David Garcia. I'm the Air and Radiation Division Director at Region 6 office in Dallas, Texas. I've been chairing this hearing session this afternoon. At this time, since there's no additional registered speakers for this session, I want to thank my fellow panelists, Michael and Jeff, everyone who offered testimony today, and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxics and other harmful air pollution from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. As a reminder, you can submit written comments on this proposal through June 26 of 2023. Instructions for submitting written comments are available on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. We will now take a recess and the next session will begin at 5 p.m. I want to thank everybody and I hope you have a wonderful day.
Hello. Welcome to today's public hearing. My name is Brenda Shine, and I'm the group lead for the Refining and Chemicals Group within the Sector Programs and Policies Division. I will be chairing the session of the virtual hearing. Thanks to all of you for attending today and taking time out of your day to share your comments on EPA's proposal to update several rules applying to synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. This proposal, which EPA announced on April 6, 2023, would significantly reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from these plants, including the highly toxic chemicals, ethylene oxide and chloroprene. The proposal encompasses three national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants, or NESHAP. The hazardous organic NESHAP, also called the HON, the group one polymers and resins NESHAP, and the group two polymers and resins NESHAP. It also addresses four new source performance standards that apply to synthetic organic chemical manufacturing. Now, I'd like to ask our other EPA panelists to introduce themselves. On the panel are... My name is Diana Francisco. I'm an exposure modeler and air toxics risk assessor in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And my name is Andrew Bouchard. I'm the project lead and engineer within EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Thank you. We are also joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. Before we begin hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to review to help make today's hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We wanna hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on this panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. We ask that everyone remain muted with their cameras off until it is your turn to speak. Okay, let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will put the names of the next speakers in the chat box. We also may use the chat box to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it is their turn. Let me apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. If you are speaking today, please rename yourself in the Zoom participant list to match your registered speaker name. This will allow our logistics staff to quickly queue up the next speakers. For assistance, chat with attendee support. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you're joining us via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of your screen. If you are joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. Please state your first and last name and spell it for the record. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you're not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. A four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it's time to stop. If you are testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you would like to share, such as slide presentations or videos, 
You may submit them to the docket for the proposal through June 26, 2023. Instructions for submitting comments are also on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. We encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post reminders about how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you're finished speaking, please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. If time allows, we may be able to add additional speakers. If you did not pre-register and are interested in speaking, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. Our logistics team will let you know if there are any time slots available and assist you with re registering. For those of you watching the hearing on YouTube and would like to speak, please email our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash on. Finally, Today's hearing consists of three sessions, morning, afternoon, and evening. If there are no additional speakers, we may close the session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We also may take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time today to share your comments on EPA's proposal. Let's get started. Our first two speakers will be Tracy Sabetta and Anna Shanai. So Tracy, I turn it over to you. Please spell your first and last name and uh, provide our testimony. Good evening and thank you. Uh, my name is Tracy Sabetta, T-R-A-C-Y, and last name is S-A-B-E-T-T-A. -T -T I'm the state coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force in Columbus, Ohio. On behalf of our 89,000 Ohio members, I strongly support the chemical manufacturing rule and call on EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities that are harming people's health. The petrochemical and chemical industry have a long history of putting the health and safety of community members and workers at risk. My father worked for decades at Diamond Shamrock Corporation located on the chemical shore in Ashtabula, Ohio. Our family lived nearby, and I remember as a child riding my bike past Fields Brook, a Lake Erie tributary where the plant discharged its waste. You could smell the chemicals in the air and the water. That area is now a Superfund site. Then on January 17, 1986, a chemical holding tank ignited at the facility and caused an explosion that killed two of my father's dearest friends, injured 18, and sent a green chemical cloud into the air. My father was covered in that green dust and was rushed to the hospital for decontamination. The doctor said he was fine, but our community would never look at those chemical plants on the shore the same way again. People need protection from these polluting facilities. Thankfully, the proposed chemical manufacturing rule would help reduce air toxics and the related cancer risks for workers and people who live near the more than 200 covered facilities that make chemicals and petrochemicals. More than 80% of those facilities have violated pollution laws during the last three years. 12 of these facilities are in Ohio. One example is BP Husky Refining Company in Oregon, not far from Toledo. This facility, which was recently sold to Synovus Energy, logged three quarters of violations of the Clean Air Act and was charged with serious violations related to an explosion that claimed two workers' lives in 2022. These are the kinds of egregious violations that will be addressed under this proposed rule. When fully implemented, the proposed rule would reduce air toxic emissions from these facilities. This can help lower the risk of workers and community members developing cancer, as well as respiratory, neurological, cardiovascular, and reproductive issues. MOMS supports the provisions included in this rule and urges you to strengthen them since there are still critically important areas to be addressed. We support the removal of the startup shutdown and malfunction exemptions for polluting episodes at facilities and wanna make sure there are no added exemptions. In addition, we support increased combustion efficiency and monitoring for flaring, including continuous emissions monitoring for the flaring stacks. 
One of the most critical provisions is enhanced leak detection and repair protocols for all hazardous chemicals across the entire facility. The failure to revise the leak standards for all toxic chemicals at the vast majority of facilities is a missed opportunity in this rule and should be addressed before finalization. To best protect heavily exposed individuals living at the fence line, we support the implementation of precedent setting fence line monitoring at all covered facilities for six toxic chemicals, including vinyl chloride, a toxic chemical everyone in Ohio became intimately familiar with following the February 3rd train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Vinyl chloride is associated with increased risk of lung and liver cancer, brain cancer, and other negative health impacts. Finally, while we appreciate the effort made by the EPA to analyze air toxic risks at the community level, we would urge EPA to use its own community-based risk assessment data to set standards that are fully protective of people's health. On behalf of my family and Moms Clean Air Force in Ohio, I strongly support the chemical manufacturing rule and call on EPA to finalize the most robust and comprehensive standards to reduce air pollution from petrochemical facilities that are harming people's health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sabeto. Um, I will ask the panel if there are any questions. Okay, well, thank you for your testimony. Um, our next uh, speaker will be Anna Shanai. Anna? Hi, uh, my name is Anna Shanai. Anna, A-A-N-A, Shanai, S-H-E-N-A-I. I am 18 years old and I'm speaking to you all today as a private citizen of Hamilton County, as well as on behalf of Action for the Climate Emergency, where I serve as leader of the Seven Hills ACE Action Team. I'd also like to thank this committee for allowing me the platform to speak as a resident of the city of Cincinnati. Cincinnati has always been my home, but recently it is under the risk of becoming home to multiple new petrochemical sites. The Ohio River Valley has become a targeted site for petrochemical companies to build new sites due to its geology and abundance of natural resources. However, the unique geography of this river valley also means that we are more pro prone to air inversions, where instead of pollution blowing away, it lingers in the valley. This creates a perfect environment for increased pollution as the chemicals settle into the air, water, and ground. As a youth climate activist, I believe that climate justice should be at the forefront of the movement. But petrochemical sites disproportionately impact marginalized communities, such as African American and Latinx communities. Stricter regulations on pet petrochemical facilities will alleviate the public health ramifications and begin to protect vulnerable communities, not harm them. It could drop the number of people at risk from 95,000 to 2,500. I know this won't solve all of the climate justice issues in Ohio, but it's a start in the right direction. I urge the EPA to pass this proposal. If not to protect our climate, please do it for generation in Cincinnati. According to the EPA, chemicals like ETO and chloroplane damage DNA, making them especially dangerous for children who are still growing. This proposal would significantly reduce HAPs, creating a healthier environment for the youngest generation. I hope the EPA takes the necessary measures to ensure that my generation can enjoy our future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Shanai. Uh, let me ask the panel if there are any clarifying questions. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Um, our next two speakers will be David Marsh and Neil Carmen. So uh, David Marsh, you're up. Hello. Hi, David. Could you spell your first and your last name for the Absolutely. record? David Marsh, D-A-V-I-D-M-A-R-S-H. I'm a private citizen. I'm also a former ethylene oxide engineer for the corporation Sterogenic. I gave testimony in the ethylene oxide rule, and I, I told the story of, of accepting the position, having a physical that had excessive vials of blood drawn, and feeling like I was a lab rat for the six months that I worked there. Two months in, I got cognitive decline, and it went downhill from there. Six months it took to get diagnosed with leukemia. And when it, I, they asked me to go to one more, to, after I got out of the hospital, they asked me to go to Santa Teresa, New Mexico for another job on New Year's Day. When I got back to Chicago, I walked into the corporate office, I said, I guess you've heard I have cancer now. And corporate HR said, yes, I know. And I have to fire you for it now. They fired me on the spot. I had no insurance to fight my cancer with. 
and I've been active in this rule process with a reasonable amount of energy and perhaps even anger. But 20 minutes after I testified, I got a phone call and it was investigators. It was an investigator investigating, not testimony, but this is, this is public comment. And they went through investigating my history, even, even walking into my, my estra estranged family and if just on fishing expedition. Um, they could, couldn't have, they were looking for a map, a cancer map that I had in 2012 that they don't claim existed until 2016. But this is a rules process. This is public comment to be subjected to interrogation. They didn't do it straight. They sent a surrogate and it started out real kind and gained trust. And then it went into full, how do you know this? How do you know that? We're, and, and it was just ridiculous. Now, moving on, this ethylene oxide is, is toxic. When I signed the training document at Stereogenics, it only said one part per million. When I woke up from and realized what was going on with ethylene oxide, it was now up to five parts per million. The rule that they're making fence line monitoring or stack monitoring, however they've decided, I'm not exactly sure. It seems confusing to me what they decided in that part of it. but. I'm sorry, I lost a train of thought. I, it, 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 I'm in pain today. Um, look, this is a rules process. I have a right. And to be intimidated like this, because I had, I wouldn't call it an executive position, but the 11 maintenance managers, the sterogenics were my direct reports for six months. Uh, apparently, I knew too much, or they got too. I don't know, but you know, it was a covert interview that turned into a pretty much investigation with people pretending to not be in the room. I could hear voices. It was scary, is my point. Shouldn't be subject to this. It it felt that we were lied to in the general meeting about the 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 specific grab. You no, know, the um, half life. We were told it was sixty days when it's two hundred eleven, and there were times when it felt like. We weren't really grieving our grievance to an arbitrator. We were grieving it to the people we were grieving against. It just felt like it was getting shifted too late in the game. And there was too many little shell games going on with start times to, to the presentations like this, where it's shell game. But the whole, the process as a whole was is good. And I thank you. I know I'm out of time. Thank you very much. But I just had to get this in because this has got to be filled with integrity again. Just okay. help us. Make sure it stays with integrity is my point, okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any clarifying questions from the panel? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker will be uh, Neil Carmen. Neil? Can you, can you hear me? Not really. Okay. I'm going to, I'm, I'm calling in, okay? I've got it on. Now? We, uh, you may, uh, we may have to work with Neil to make sure his sound comes on. Um, we will do that. Um, but in the meantime, let's, let's uh, take the next two speakers. Uh, the first will be Michelle Mabson and then Elena Malik. And so uh, Michelle, if you're there, um, would you provide your testimony, your first name and your last name and spell it out? Yeah, hi there, good evening. Uh, Michelle Mapson, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-M-A-B-S-O-N. And I'm a staff scientist at Earth Justice. EPA's findings that the health risks posed by Han and Polymer resident facilities are unacceptable is an important step towards ensuring that all residents live in safe and healthy communities. However, if finalized in its current form, the proposed rule will ignore serious toxic emissions and will fail to protect the public with an ample margin of safety. EPA's core mission is to protect human health in the environment, which includes the use of the best available science in its regulatory process. I commend the agency for continuing to affirm both the 2010 and 2016 iris derived risk values 
as the best available science for evaluating the cancer risk posed by chloroprene and ethylene oxide respectively, and for relying on its use in this proposed rulemaking. Further, I thank the agency for conducting a residual risk assessment using its authority under Section 112 of the Clean Air Act. Nevertheless, EPA's residual risk assessment contains missing information and underestimates of emissions data, which means that cancer and non-cancer risk posed by these facilities is woefully underestimated. EPA found that the Han source Okay, it looks like we're back. Um, momentarily went somewhere. Michelle, are you still there? I'm here. I'm sorry for that. Um, um, yeah, I'm happy to start where I was. <laughs> okay, um, let me make sure everyone else is back. It looks like it. So yeah, please, please continue, Michelle. Sorry about that. No problem. So EPA found that the Han source category emits 8,200 tons or an astounding 18 million pounds of hazardous air pollutants each year. And it should be noted that as my colleague Tosh Sager pointed out earlier, EPA's failure to include one bromopropane emissions in this proposal means that emissions from this source category are much higher than EPA has calculated. The residual risk assessment found cancer risk as high as 2,001 million, and this is 20 times higher than EPA's presumptive benchmark for unacceptable cancer risk. And the risks are likely much higher given EPA's failure to fully account for health risks from the 4,000 pounds of lead emitted by HOM facilities each year. Alarmingly, when it comes to lead, a heavy metal that is emitted by 43 facilities that is known to cause severe neurological harm to children in the developing fetus, EPA effectively assigns a health risk value of zero to lead emissions because instead of calculating the chronic health risk from lead as a bioaccumulative and persistent HAP, EPA only considers that a given facility does not exceed the 2008 lead NAAQS and does not even attempt to quantitatively account for lead-related risks. EPA must update the residual risk assessment to include available data on testing of lead in soil and waterways and evaluate the potential health impacts following the emission of lead from each facility. Additional monitoring should be required to ensure that lead emitted from these facilities are low enough concentrations such that it does not raise an individual's blood lead level. Finally, as a part of its risk assessment, EPA determined that the cancer risk driven by ethylene oxide and chloroprene emissions were unacceptable and calculated that with the application of post-emission controls, cancer risk would be reduced to 101 million. EPA has previously held that cancer risk above 101 million poses unacceptable health risks and earth justice, as well as many community groups and scientists have argued that its benchmark is far too high. EPA did not base its threshold on scientific information about health risks, and in reality, the national average for cancer risk from air pollution falls closer to 30 in a million. Allowing communities that have already faced years of undue exposure to ethylene oxide and lead and chloroprene and dozens of other toxic air pollutants to continue to face over three times the national cancer risk is unacceptable. To conclude, EPA must act to farther reduce the health risk posed by Han and polymer and resin facilities. There are a number of other ways that the residual risk assessments underestimate risk and our comments will elaborate on these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Mapson. Um, let me ask the panel if there is any uh, clarifying questions. Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Mapson. Uh, and then our next speaker will be Elena Malik. Elena, if you're there. Hello, hi. Um, Hi, Lynn. Please spell your, your name, first name, last name for the record and provide us your testimony. My name is Elena Malik, E-L-E-N-A-M-A-L-I-K. I'm an attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund and I live in New Orleans. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for creating a forum to hear from invest interested stakeholders. We urge EPA to fully engage with and carefully consider the views of individuals from affected communities in finalizing the strongest possible rule to protect public health. 
We strongly support EPA's proposal to strengthen clean air protections for the nation's largest chemical manufacturing facilities. EPA's proposal is a crucial step towards reducing toxic air pollution and protecting health and safety across the nation. Stronger pr protections are especially urgent in light of the extensive and well-documented history of non-compliance at chemical manufacturing facilities, many of which are also persistent violators of our nation's clean water laws. EDF analyzed data from more than 200 of the largest chemical manufacturing facilities that would likely be covered by the proposed standards and found that over 50% of those facilities are currently violating one or more of our nation's environmental laws. Further, more than 80% of these facilities have been found to be in non-compliance with environmental laws in the past three years. EPA's proposal covers an estimated 227 facilities, almost 60% of which are in the densely polluted petrochemical corridor spanning Louisiana and Texas. Many of the communities living in these areas are historically overburdened by toxic air pollution and do not have adequate resources to identify and address the health and safety risks posed by toxic emissions. Moreover, the facilities located in these areas routinely, environment, routinely violate environmental laws. 91% of the largest chemical manufacturing facilities in Texas and 80% in Louisiana have been in non-compliance with one or more environmental laws during the last three years. EPA's proposal includes many important improvements and we would like to highlight several key features of the proposal along with ways we urge EPA to further strengthen the proposed standards. With respect to the community-focused risk analysis, EPA's proposal represents an important step forward to measure the health and safety risks faced by communities, especially those with several facilities emitting multiple toxic air pollutants. We support EPA's efforts to be better characterize these risks and urge EPA to finalize a risk assessment that is rigorous and comprehensive. We likewise urge EPA to ensure the findings in this risk analysis are linked more directly to requirements to reduce emissions and therefore risks in the final rule. The proposed HON rule includes important fence line monitoring for six hazardous air pollutants. Requirements that are proven especially critical given EPA's analysis showing that measured pollution levels at the fence line of some facilities far exceed model levels based on the facility's self-reported emissions. We urge EPA to further strengthen the rule by lowering action levels and expanding these vital fence line monitoring requirements to encompass a greater number of chemicals and facilities. Recognizing that fence line monitoring requirements work together with other equipment specific requirements in the rule, we urge EPA to ensure those standards are as protective as possible to identify important opportunities to strengthen leak detection and repair requirements and ensure they reflect technical advances that have occurred since EPA last updated these standards. A strengthened HON rule is critical and urgently needed to reduce pollution, protect the health and safety of fence line communities, and hold polluters accountable. Thank you for considering our views, and we look forward to providing more detailed comments on other important features of the proposal, including flaring requirements and action to ensure the startup shutdown and malfunction loophole is fully and forever closed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malik. Um... Are there any clarifying questions from the panel? No, okay, thank you, Ms. Malik. Uh, our next speaker will be Amy Kyle. Amy, if you're there. Hello. I'm here. Um, my connection is a little bit flaky, so I'm gonna leave my um, video off. But um, my name is Amy, Dr. Amy Kyle, and I am a, a former breaker and academic um, with expertise in children's environmental health and assessment of air toxics. So um, first of all, I wanna say that the, this facility category is uh, one of the biggest emitters and most important emitters of air toxics. And I'm very glad as I know a number of my colleagues are for um, EPA to, to redoing this rule. Um, there are a lot of good things in the rule, some things that have advanced. And there are also things I think really should be stronger given the fairly dire nature of these compounds that are emitted out of, out of these facilities. These are still some very nasty, very toxic compounds and we should be taking strong steps to prevent them from being emitted. And I would, I'm speaking somewhat also with the lens of uh, environmental justice, which is been adopted as a priority both for this administration and, and for EPA. And the um, 
stationary sources of air toxics are unfortunately often congregated or more common in communities of lower income and communities of color for a variety of social and economic reasons that are beyond the purview of EPA, but which require EPA and environmental protection movement to take account of this distribution. And one of the flaws of this um, process is it really hasn't done that. I think the best solution for that is to stop the emissions as much as humanly possible, uh, because the distribution of, of these emissions toward these communities um, is it, hard to turn around. It's as hard, probably, to cut down on some of these emissions. And the provisions in this new rule, I think, need to be strengthened in that regard. Um, for, there's, as I say, there are good elements to these that, that need to be strengthened and expanded. First of all, looking at the fugitive emissions. It's very important, should be done for all facilities. I went to an EPA um, meeting about the ETO aspects specifically at which uh, some of the representatives said, well, they didn't know that there were fugitive emissions. I think this was a sterilizer facility. But we should always be looking, you know, that's something that is always examined at every facility. Secondly, is the issue of monitoring and fixing leaks. You know, it's a little surprising to me in the 21st century that so much of this rule is about monitoring and fixing leaks, in that you would think this technology would have evolved so there weren't so many leaks and that that wasn't such a significant component of the emissions. So, um, there are improvements here that need to be strengthened to more robust sensing and, and um, reporting of le leaks so that they can not go on so long. We really would be eliminating those. Third, the fence line and community monitoring and, and verification provisions are essential. Again, these need to be extended to all facilities that are um, manufacturing chemical. Uh, they're, they're, are some details about that that need to be strengthened that I don't have time to go into, but that need to be attended to. And then finally, in terms of the, um, of the technological side, that there's still a lot of provision for venting and flaring. And that is, um, those are being brought down, but why are we flaring these chemicals? You know, that it just seems like in the 21st century, again, we should be designing chemical plants that don't incorporate flaring. Um, and that don't have venting be designed in, you know, the emissions should be going through non-vented treated streams. So um, thank you for allowing me to comment today. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. Um, let me uh, ask the panel if there are any uh, clarifying questions. Okay, appreciate that. All right, uh, let's see, our next speaker uh, will be Neil Carmen. Neil, are you there? Can you hear me? No. Nope. Okay. I'm gonna, I will try to call back in on another computer, okay? Okay, I think what you said was you're gonna try to call back in, that'd be fine. Um, uh, and in the meantime, we do have another speaker, um, Jessica Thomas. Jessica, would you go ahead and uh, spell your name? and provide us your testimony. Great, thank you so much. My name is Jessica Thomas, that's J-E-S-S-I-C-A, -S -S last name T-H-O-M-A-S. I am a resident of uh, Marion, South Carolina. I'm calling you from, from that location now. Um, and while I don't have any facilities, Han facilities or the facilities of this uh, type in my more immediate area, there certainly are three or four in South Carolina and many more across the country. Disproportionately uh, in the South and in the Southeast, the Deep South, um, and really these facilities are, according to um, EPA's own community risk assessment, disproportionately impacting Black communities, African American communities, and that is an environmental injustice and that is unacceptable. Um, 
I do appreciate the move forward, the progress that uh, this rule does include, including fence line monitoring. Um, I will also say that it's good to see the iris risk value being affirmed here and utilized here. We know that's a more protective, more accurate value of the, the real harm and risk um, that ethylene oxide poses. And EPA's own scientists have known and shown this since 2016. So we're almost, we're seven years now on from that risk value being um, stated. And so it's more than time to put that in place. And we know that this, that strong science and community lived experience does affirm that uh, this is a toxic cancer causing chemical. Um, we, I, I look at the community risk assessment and I see 2,500 people, even after this rule is in place, 2,500 people will still have a cancer risk over 101 million just from these facilities alone. And I think that is unconscionable um, for who, who, who are those 2,500 people I think about? Is it my mom? Is it my sister? Is it my cousin? Is it your mom, your sister, your cousin? Who are we willing to sacrifice? Um, and, and I really hope that you all hear and understand that the only acceptable health risk is zero. Zero. There is no room for error there because these are people's lives and this is people's health. Um, and so I wanted to lift that up and I, I look at the list of facilities and I see friends and I see family right in the line of fire. And I see corporations that are responsible for explosions that happen through, uh, you know, utilization of this and other chemicals. Many facilities are on the risk management plan, um, EPA's other program around chemical disaster rule. These companies also are responsible for putting toxic levels of PFAS in our environment um, and lying about the science. So really we need to tighten up on these corporations. I see I have one minute left. I wanted to end with, this is just one category of seven or eight facility source types that are emitting ethylene oxide. And therefore, and we don't have a full picture of the burden, the exposure that folks have to ethylene oxide. We need to be looking at this from a more holistic view, taking into account all of these source categories. The risk is probably much, much higher, the cancer risk, on top of the other chemicals, the other social stressors that folks are exposed to. So um, with that, I thank you again, EPA, for moving on this and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Um... Were there any clarifying questions from the panel? Okay, Ms. Thomas, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, at this time, I think we will take a break. Again, my name is Brenda Shine, and I've been chairing this hearing session. And I wanna thank everyone who shared comments so far today on EPA's proposed action. If you have any questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and our logistics team will reach out to you to let you know if there are any time slots available. If you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash Han. At this time, we're gonna take a short recess. We'll resume the hearing at the time shown on the slide.
Hi, Christine. I'm on. Recorded. The recording has stopped.
Hello, and welcome back from the break. Uh, my name is Brenda Shine, and I'm the group leader for the Refining and Chemicals Group in EPA's Sector Policies and Programs Division, Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And I'm chairing this session of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from plants that make up synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. Joining me on the panel are... My name is Diana Francisco. I'm an exposure modeler and air toxics risk assessor with EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. My name is Andrew Bouchard. I'm the project lead and engineer within EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Okay. Thank you. I want to remind you that today's hearing is being recorded and transcribed to produce a written transcript of the hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. For those of you on Zoom, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you're joining us via the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Our logistics team will add you to today's agenda if there are any time slots available. If you're watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, please email our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa dot gov forward slash eto forward slash hon. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. That includes rules of behavior. EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing event. EPA expects all participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees, to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. And as a quick reminder about providing testimony, when I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. While you are providing testimony, you are also welcome to activate your camera by clicking on the start video icon. Please state and spell your name for the record. A four minute timer will be started when you state your name. And now I think we have one speaker uh, Mr. Neil Harmon. Neil, are you there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes we can. Could you uh, spell your name, Neil, and yes. uh, provide us your testimony? Thank you. Neil, N E I L, Carmen, C A R M A N. I work with the Sierra Club uh, in Texas for over 30 years on air toxics. Uh, Texas has more of these plants, 82, than uh, any uh, state in the nation. I also worked with the state uh, environmental agency, the TCQ, for 12 years. So I'm familiar with uh, NESHAPs and NSPS regulations. So I want to thank EPA for developing uh, these rules. I do think they could be improved. Uh, I think one of the areas, of course, is the whole area of risk. Because uh, in uh, Houston Ship Channel, which is 23 mile long, uh, there's uh, tens of thousands of people living in many communities. There's 40 of these Han plants on the Houston Chip Channel. And some of the uh, pollution uh, from these rules drifts into Houston. So there's actually several million people that are impacted, not just the environmental justice communities and dozens of neighborhoods in the Houston Chip Channel. Uh, and then we have other areas in Texas. 
uh, such as Beaumont, Port Arthur. There's another, you know, nearly a dozen plants there. So Texas has uh, many, many uh, large petrochemical and chemical plants and complexes and clusters of these plants. So this rule is very critical for cleaner air in Texas from these air toxics. Um, I'm concerned about flare efficiency because uh, I think this has been a long-term problem at some of the plants that uh, I've been involved in uh, citizen uh, suits uh, enforcement actions under the Clean Air Act. And uh, we see a lot of smoking events at, at flares uh, from the petrochemical and chemical plants uh, connected to this rule. Um, the problem is that uh, these plants self-estimate what those emissions are. And so they don't use any kind of a CEM or continuous emission monitoring system for these chemicals, whether it's ethylene oxide or 1,3-butadiene or others under this rule. Um, and I think just improving combustion efficiency is not sufficient. I think there needs to be some kind of a robust actual uh, stack emissions monitoring uh, technology required. Um, but this rule doesn't do that. Uh, also, I think that the uh, leak detection and repair program, it's a step forward. But again, uh, the plants, uh, many of the plants I've been in over the decades do have a lot of leakless pumps, but they are more expensive. If the plants did have leakless pumps and valves, then they wouldn't need to do this uh, leak detection and repair program. So I think that this is something that the EPA ought to really require in this regulation because this technology for leakless pumps and valves has been around for decades. Um, also, I think the startup shutdown um, and malfunction rules, uh, those exemptions need to go away. Uh, the plants have many technologies today, uh, better monitoring of their processes, and uh, a lot of uh, instrumentation uh, in their control rooms and out in the plant area. So um, the, um, the, the need for that, those exemptions, they're, they're gone. So EPA, I uh, thank you for doing away with that exemption and don't create any more. Um, another thing is fence line monitoring, I think is also uh, very critical. Uh, because right now these plants don't have any kind of uh, air toxics monitoring uh, at their fence line. It's already been successfully applied to benzene at the uh, 140 some refineries in the U.S. So anyway, thank you, EPA. Uh, please uh, improve the rule to help deal with these uh, big clusters of plants. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Farman. Uh, let me uh, ask the panel if there's any uh, clarifying questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we do have another speaker. Uh, we have Miriam Rotkin Elman. Miriam, if you're there. Hi, yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Would you uh, spell your name for the record and begin providing a, your testimony? Sure. So my name is Miriam Rotkin Elman, M I R I A M, last name R O T K I N E L L M A N. I'm a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and, um, and my specialty is public health. So I, I, I want to start by first applauding for thank you for the opportunity and applauding EPA for taking action on this sector. Um, EPA's own estimates of the risk to surrounding communities at baseline are horrifying. Those numbers, you all calculated millions of folks within the 10 kilometer radius with excess cancer risk at baseline. This is a sector that's been long ignored and we haven't seen the attention drawn to it. The, the thousands um, of folks within that same radius with over a hundred in a million cancer risk. We heard, you heard today, testimony after testimony, that this is not only an injustice, it's also a heartbreak, right? Those cancer risks translate to real people's lives, destroyed in preventable deaths because of the emissions from these facilities. I've worked time and time again with communities um, who ask me more or less the same questions about residual risk assessments. They always ask me, every single time, no matter where they are, no matter the sector, why does EPA use 100 in a million cancer risk? What does 50 in a, cancer, in a million cancer risk mean? One in a million cancer risk. 
How is that just? Why do they get to say what's acceptable? Where, what happens? Where are my protections, right? And I answer them the same as what I'm about to say here. Those are policy decisions. Those are policy decisions you all are making right now. You are looking at estimates of risk in predominantly communities of color as your radius gets closer and closer to these facilities, the percent African-American increases dramatically your own evaluation. This is an environmental injustice and this rule is a chance to remedy that. You have left a lot of risk in these communities by your own estimates. The law allows you to go back and set more stringent emission limits. That level of risk means those emission limits, those control technologies are not sufficient. You've heard a number of comments today on suggestions on how to change that. And the final rule should have much lower residual risk. That's what it would mean to deliver environmental justice for the communities long denied. That also means that the accountability to that risk happens at the fence line. You've heard chemical trespass. That fence line monitoring provides the only accountability communities have, that, that those conditions that those plants are creating are not poisoning them. That fence line monitoring therefore needs to be as comprehensive as possible. It needs to include all of the contaminants on the emissions profile. The corrective action levels need to be at the levels that mean that any trespass that could harm someone's health will receive corrective action. Imagine who's standing there at that fence line and what trigger levels you wanna see if you were there. That's what is needed to provide the accountability that those emission limits, that those process changes, that those control technologies are actually delivering the promise of environmental justice that this administration has requested. That's what's needed and that's what you all have the capacity to do. Thanks so much for the time. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Rotkin Elman. Um, let me ask the panel, are there any clarifying questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Rotkin Elman. Um, we do have another speaker, Christine Bennett, and I understand, Christine, you're on the phone. So I just wanna remind you to press star six to unmute. Christine, are you there? Christine, you could press star six to unmute if you can. This is Bennett. I think you're off mute. Try to say something. Oh, I think you just went back on mute. Let's try it one more time. Mrs. B, I think you're on mute. This is Steph speaking. I, I think you're off mute now. Try to say something. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, we do, we do have another speaker, Wilma Subra, who also is on the phone. Um, Wilma, I, I, the floor is yours. If, if you're there, if you are on the phone, you might also have to press star six, but I don't wanna, say, you know, let's see if you're there. Wilma, are you there? Okay, I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Wilma, would you uh, spell your first and last name and and then provide us with your testimony? Sure. My name is Wilma Subra, W-I-L-M-A-S-U-B as in boy, R-A, and I'm with Louisiana Environmental Action Network, and I work with the community in Mossville, which consists of Christine Bennett, and hopefully she will get on after I did. So the issues here, Neil sort of laid out the issues for you, but one of the issues is that these industrial facilities are all clustered together and the communities are sandwiched in between these industrial facilities. 
So you also have what in Louisiana we call incidents, where they call in to emergency response and register with EPA and LGEQ how much chemicals they release during incidents or events. And these are usually not added on until the end of the year. So frequently it's huge quantities that are not getting accounted for in their permits. And then when you look at all the chemicals that you are regulating and all the industrial facilities clustered together that you are regulating, the issue is the cumulative impact. It's impossible to just say, this is the only chemical and this is how much they're allowed to release and this is all the community is being exposed to. They're being exposed to a whole host of chemicals from each individual facility and it is causing a huge quantity of very negative impacts, particularly the communities in Mossville where the industrial facilities are clustered all around where they live, where they work, and where they worship. And these negative health impacts have been going on for much, much, much too long. And they need relief from being exposed to all of these chemicals, particularly in the air. And then also when they're discharged, they are contaminating their water. And then they're also contaminating the soil and sediment. Many, many decades ago when Sam Coleman was head of EPA Region 6, he did an evaluation of should Mossville be a Superfund site, but he eliminated the air emissions. And if we'd have had the air emissions added to those sources, we would have had a Superfund site for the communities in Mossville. Now you're looking at just the air emissions, and I don't want that to be dismissed and saying, oh, that's all they're being exposed to. It needs to be a cumulative impact of everything they are being exposed to on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wilma. Um, let me uh, make sure there are no uh, clarifying questions from the panel. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go back and see if we can go back to Christine Bennett. Um, Christine? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Christine, great. Would you uh, spell your name and uh, provide us your testimony? Christine, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -E -N -N -E -T. Okay. Go ahead, thank you, go ahead. Okay, I noticed there were two young people, Dana and Andrew with Air Quality that are listening on. You know, we got a lot of listeners and my testimony is, I feel like we're back in slavery and Harriet Tubman is dead, been dead. And unless we get another Harriet Tubman, Mossville gonna all die out. I am a family of 13 in the family. So far we had two kidney failures and three cancers and a daughter that passed and a niece that, I mean, do my whole family has to be has to die before we get help? We've been been promising over forty years to get us out of the area where we're surrounded by toxic air. We done spoke, we done cried, we done beat up, we done did everything. When will we? And I think it was I don't know. I tried to get some notes. I think Brenda Shine. I said that it shouldn't be any discrimination. Said a whole list of things that we should not do. I don't want to disrespect anyone. But at the same time that we, as fence line communities, being disrespected, we're told not to disrespect. How much more can a person take living in an area for all these years with her children and everything? And yet we breathe this toxic cocktail every day. I moved just over the bridge to Lake Charles, and I promise you, it followed me. I'm just asking, is there anything we can do to get out of there and live the rest of our life without toxic air? I asked Matt in the uh, EPA with the president, is there anywhere in this area we can go? Is there anywhere we can go to at least live whatever time we have left with about toxic air. 
You know, it, it, it just, it's sad. I, I really feel like we're back in slavery and that we're here until we die. You know, somebody got to come and help us. And I'm just saying that we, we listen to Neil talk about, uh, he's in the Sierra Club right there in Texas, which is only Port off and Beaumont is only an hour from us. We're all fighting 16 industries that are surrounding Mossville. Families dying every day. I keep repeating myself because somebody's not listening. We have meeting, all the meetings that we put out and all the money and the grants that we put out. Why are we still in Mossville? Why are we still allowing uh, Sasol to put out the cancer-causing chemicals every day on us? And they say that you have to breathe so much before you get cancer. Man. Uh, we might have lost Miss Bennett. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. And all I want to ask uh, in my testimony is that I'm sick. Have a son that's down, and do I have to wait for my kids to bury me, or I bury them? Because the norm is not the parents go before the children anymore. And I'm saying we have talked ourselves out. We can't talk anymore. The time is out, you guys. I mean, we're just a small group left in Mossville, and I thank God for all the people that has reached out to help us, but we're still there, and the people are still dying. How can you say you're on a panel with toxic air and people still dying every day along the fence line, and nobody's caring? We just talk, talk, talk. We've been promised this past month that they were going to put up monitors, air monitors, by uh, Mr. Regan, and I don't know if Wilma spoke on it, but they are, no one told us they are monitors are there. Everything they do is undercover. We never know what they're doing. They they even came into our little community again, and we don't know nothing. And they say, well, we spoke to this pastor, and we spoke to these people. Why you don't speak to those who've been fighting for 40-some years when you're getting ready to put some more dirt on us? I mean, all you're doing is bearing us. Please, somebody help us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Um, are there any questions from the panel? No. Thank you, Ms. Bennett, for your testimony. Um, I don't know if we have anybody left. Okay, I think we'll, we'll take a short break. So again, um, my name is Brenda Shine, and I've been chairing this session. I want to thank everybody who shared comments so far today on our proposed action. If you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and our logistics team will reach out to you to let you know if there are any time slots available. If you are watching the hearing on YouTube and are interested in speaking, Please email our registration support team. That email address is in the public hearing box on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. At this time, we'll take a short recess and we'll resume the hearing at the time shown on the slide.
Hello, my name is Brenda Schein, and I have been chairing this hearing session. There are no additional registered speakers for today's hearing. And so I wanna thank my fellow panelists and everyone who offered testimony today and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce emissions of toxic and other harmful air pollution from plants that make synthetic organic chemicals and plants that make certain polymers and resins. As a reminder, you can submit written comments on this proposal through June 26, 2023. Instructions for submitting written comments are available on our website at www.epa.gov forward slash ETO forward slash HON. Thank you for joining us. Today's hearing will now adjourn.